Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. There was a discount at the nuclear revenge store and we got a two for one special for you today. But first, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our revenger got her stalker police officer imprisoned and got rid of her bullying neighbor at the same time. There's a lot of moving parts to the story and I'll try not to lose anyone along the way. I'm a female in my late 20s and this story took place a while ago. Let me start by saying that I was no angel growing up. My parents were very religious and cared a lot about what people thought of them. I on the other hand had a habit of taking things that didn't belong to me because I wanted them and my parents wouldn't get it for me. I was first arrested when I was 12 for shoplifting. I have something of a sweet tooth. One day I was trying to stuff some chocolate bars in my pants while in a store and this shadow just appeared over me. The next thing I knew, these huge hands went into my pants and pulled out the chocolate bars. This was my first encounter with Officer Squarejaw. He was about twice my age at the time and looked like he was the mold they made marines from. He convinced the store owner not to press charges and I was let go with a warning. I immediately learned my lesson and decided to change my tactics to more distant targets. I was 16 the next time I was arrested, this time it was for fraud. I got a fake ID and used it to get a job in a bar where I was skimming credit cards and using them to buy stuff. Officer Squarejaw just happened to be in the bar one night and caught me. This time I didn't get a warning. I was sent to juvenile detention or youth detention as they like to call it these days. Being locked up with a bunch of teenage girls is a lot like high school combined with a sleepover you can never leave. I was always kind of a loner. I wasn't really strong. In fact, I was actually very timid. So I was fish food from the jump. And I got jumped. Going through that on a nearly daily basis completely broke me. I know what you're thinking. She probably deserved it. Stealing from others is bad. And you know what? I agree with you. What I did was wrong and I deserved every moment of heck for the two years I was inside. I was a selfish person and I'm sure I hurt a lot of people with my stealing. I was alone for those two years because my parents couldn't handle the shame of a child in prison. They left town as soon as the judge banged the gavel. The person I spent the most time with in juvie was also the one who beat me the worst. We'll call her the Dean because she ran the center. The Dean was hardcore. She used to brag about how she had boyfriends all over town and separate phones for each one so they wouldn't find out about each other. When I got out, my real nightmare began. My parents wanted nothing to do with me after I went in, so I wasn't expecting anyone to be there to pick me up. But there he was, Officer Squarejaw. He was pushing 30 now, and time did nothing to mellow him out. He even came in his patrol car to take me back to town. After everything I'd been through the past two years, I was too scared to refuse a ride with him. He made me ride in the back because of regulations or something, civilians can't sit in the front. The entire drive to town, he kept telling me how he wants to look out for me, that him arresting me was for my own good, and that now he'll take care of me, make sure that I stay on the right path. When we got to town, he dropped me off in front of a diner that was his aunt's, and that he arranged with her to give me a job that I should start earning an honest living. The truth was, I was done with stealing, with crime in general. I just wanted to be left alone, which is why I didn't want to stay in the halfway house, and that meant getting my own place, and that meant getting a job. The town I lived in wasn't big, but it wasn't small either. Everybody didn't know each other, but you didn't need to ask a lot of people before finding somebody who knew you. In a town like mine, that means it's hard to keep a low profile once people start thinking you're a criminal. And since I was desperate for a job, I went into the diner and told his aunt I was there to work. In some way, I was relieved and grateful for the second chance. But Squarejaw still scared me. To her credit, the diner owner was a decent person, unlike her nephew. She hired me as a waitress because she said I had a pretty face. I don't remember anyone ever saying that to me before. She paid me fairly, which was completely unexpected, so I was really grateful. I worked hard, and eventually I was able to afford a place to rent. Squarejaw didn't want anything at first. He just hung around the diner when he was on lunch, and insisted on taking me home after my shift if he was around, always in the backseat. He made sure to drop me off in front of my apartment building and watch me go in. It wasn't a fancy place or anything. I could have afforded a slightly nicer place if I wanted to, 
even on my paycheck, but I was saving up my money for when my probation was over so that I could leave town. Up until that point, the ride home was the worst thing I had to deal with, which made what happened when I got home seem worse. My neighbors were nice people. I don't think they knew about me, and if they did, they pretended like they didn't. Their daughter, let's call her Miniskirt, she was one of those attractive girls who were also attracted to violence. She and her friends made the one flight of stairs to my apartment seem like an eternity. Some days there'd be no one at the top, and I'd just go into my apartment. Other days, she and her friends would be there and they'd either trip me or push me when no one was looking, and if people were around, they'd whisper horrible things at me. Things they would do to me or get their guy friends to do to me. It was like they could smell the weakness in me. The worst part of it all was they were younger than me. Miniskirt was only 15. I don't know what was worse, the fear of being bullied or the shame that I was older than them. After a while, things with Officer Squarejaw started escalating. It seemed weird at first and didn't make sense. On the rides home, he would ask me random but oddly specific questions. He'd say like, how was the cheese flavored two minute noodles? You shouldn't eat so many Oreos because it'll affect your figure. It only clicked when specifically mentioning the brand of tampons I was using and asking if they were what worked best for me. I never told him any of these details and I never went shopping with him. I later realized that he was going through my trash. We had communal bins outside the apartment, and I threw my trash away late at night because I didn't want to run into anyone. One night, after I realized that he'd been going through my trash, I saw his personal car was parked down the street and it had a view of the trash bins. I recognized his car because he'd picked me up from home a few times on the way to work. He also made me ride in the back because he didn't want people to get the wrong impression. Knowing that he was out there watching me made me terrified. I couldn't sleep. I would spend most nights sitting by the window near the fire escape with the lights off watching him until he left. Only after that could I fall asleep. All those nights allowed me to get to know Miniskirt really well. Unlike the Dean, she only had one phone and she didn't want her boyfriend texting her because her parents checked her phone. So she would lean out of the window of her room and have these loud whisper phone calls with him. Apparently it was easier to delete a phone call than a whole night's worth of texts. It didn't take long to figure out who he was. We'll call him Kix. Kix and I went to the same high school. He was the same age as me. And the two of them were very intimate. I mean, all the way intimate. Some nights she would sneak out of the fire escape to go to parties with him. Things with Officer Squarejaw were getting worse. Because I was afraid to throw away my trash when he was outside, it started piling up in my apartment. I'd wait until the garbage collection was made and then I'd have to make two or three trips down to the bins. He was moody for the next few weeks after that. I was so scared in that back seat that I thought I should start throwing my garbage away like normal again. Then one day he was smiling when he picked me up and after that, I wished I never hid my garbage from him. He bought me a cell phone. He said that he noticed that I don't really talk to anyone and that it wasn't healthy, that a girl my age should be texting and making friends. I didn't want friends. I didn't want anyone near me or talking to me, but how could I say no? His number was already on the phone, so when the first message came in later that night, his name on the screen made it feel like he was standing in the room with me. I didn't read any of them that night. I didn't even open them. The next day, he asked me why I didn't respond to him, and I told him I wasn't used to having a phone, so I put it on silent so that I could get some sleep. He asked me why I wasn't sleeping, and I said it was because I was having nightmares from my time away. He said if I wanted, he could park outside my place if it would make me feel safer. I told him he didn't have to do that, but he insisted that when he didn't have a night shift, he would watch over me. Like I'm an idiot who didn't know he was already doing that. From then on, he would just appear wherever I was when I wasn't at home or at the diner. He had put some kind of tracking software on my phone. I was too scared to delete it because then he would know that I found it. I also didn't have anyone that I could tell about it because who was going to believe me? I eventually stopped going out except to go to work and buy groceries. I would just respond to his first few texts at night and say I need to go to bed. After a while, he started getting bolder, suggesting that if I still feel unsafe that maybe he could spend the night with me a couple nights a week. 
He kept insisting that he was looking out for me and that all he wanted to do was protect me. I heard stories from some of the other girls inside of similar things that happened to them and how bad it got once they opened that door. I told him no as firmly as I could. He didn't like that. He said that I should think carefully about what I want in life because he is the best thing that happened to me because not even my parents wanted me. I had never been so scared in my life. The only other person that I spoke to was his aunt and she thought he was a model citizen. I had no one I could go to for help. Of course, Miniskirt decided that tormenting me at home wasn't enough. She and her friends came to the diner during my shifts. They would do things like complain that I messed up their orders, spilled their drinks, or that I was rude to them, all so that they could get free meals or discounts. All those free meals and discounts came out of my paycheck. They once even insisted that I had to pay for their dry cleaning after they spilled their drinks on it. Soon after, it completely escalated to them straight up demanding money from me. I realized that if this kept going on, I'd never have enough money to leave town, and I'd be trapped there. It was like being back inside again. If I had to go through that again, I would rather end it all. This was my life for the first year after being released. One night, while sitting by the window waiting for his text so I can get it over with and go to sleep, I overheard Miniskirt saying to Kix she wished that he'd paid more attention to her. And I thought to myself, you can have my problems if you want them. And suddenly, I had the dumbest idea of my life. All thieves are like squirrels. We want to have other people's things and we don't want other people taking our things. Every thief who's been doing it for a while has a little nest. Somewhere they keep something aside. Before I was caught, I also had a little squirrel nest. I'd planned on going to it when my probation was over, on my way out of town. I meant it when I said that I was done with stealing, but apart from a little bit of money, I'd also stashed a backup card skimmer. I was going to get rid of it, I promise. One day, when I knew that Squarejaw was on patrol and couldn't follow me, I went to my nest and collected the money and the skimmer. I wore the skimmer to work under my apron, waiting for the day Minnie Skirt and her friends showed up again. Miniskirt had a prepaid credit card that she liked to pay with. It was about a week or two of waiting when they finally showed up again. I gave them my best service to avoid the free meal, and when I got her credit card, I quickly copied it on my way to the register before settling their bill. That night, I waited until she was in her room and used their Wi-Fi to buy a phone online. I know, stealing Wi-Fi is wrong. I made sure to spread the payments so that she wouldn't notice a big charge. I specifically made sure that the delivery came to their place when no one was home so that I could collect it. When I took out the phone, I wrote the number on the packaging with a note saying, let's talk, no names. I waited until Square Jaw was outside again and Miniskirt was at home before tossing it in the garbage. I made sure that he saw me noticing him in his car when I threw it away. I also made sure that there were no fingerprints on it, just in case the creep wanted to keep it as a souvenir. When I got back to my apartment, I went to the window and watched him go to the garbage to collect the empty package. He got back into his car, and in seconds a message came through. Hey, why no names? I messaged back saying that I thought about what he said, and that he was right. I said that I wanted to take things, and because our history, I wanted to start again as if we were strangers. I mentioned how he'd known me since I was 12, and that I wanted him to think of me as a woman, and not a little girl anymore. I told him that I was going shopping soon to buy some new clothes to wear for him, if he wanted to make sure I was safe, from a distance. I picked a weekend when I knew Miniskirt was also going to be at the mall. I had two reasons for wanting to go to the mall. First, I wanted Squarejaw and Miniskirt in the same place at the same time. Second, I wanted to buy some new clothes that matched some of the clothes I'd seen Miniskirt wearing when she sneaks out. I used the cash from my squirrel nest to buy the clothes. That first weekend, I walked around the mall casing out the stores that had the clothes I'd seen her wear. I also tried to follow Miniskirt a little bit because I was carrying the phone I'd bought with her card, so I wanted the phone to be near the places she went as well. I bought two or three things because I wanted to spread out the buying. Squarejaw was unsubtly following me the whole day, which explained why he was only arresting 12-year-old girls. I started to text him a lot. I kept telling him how safe he made me feel and even that when I was small I knew I needed him. 
During our texts on the new phone, I told Squarejaw that when we meet in person, we should act like how we always behaved until it made sense for us to be together in public. He agreed, so he'd pick me up as usual, in the back seat, and drop me off at home. Minnie Skirt and her crew still kept bullying me, but I could take it this time. After a few more weeks of texting and shopping, Squarejaw was starting to get impatient. He wanted more, and it was time for the next phase of my plan. This part was really tricky. I had to wait until Minnie Skirt sneaked out again. I laid out all the clothes I bought that matched hers and would wait by the window watching and listening for when she left. The plan was to see what she was wearing, dress the same way or close to it, and then follow her to the party or wherever she went. It took almost two weeks of waiting before it happened the first time. Green skirt, pink top with orange stripes and black pumps. I put leggings on because I had at least that much self-respect, and I wore sneakers instead of pumps because I knew I wasn't getting a ride. I was dressed in a flash and out the door with my backpack before she got to the street. As I said before, the town isn't small, but it isn't that big either. There aren't that many places where teens hang out, and I'd been paying close attention everywhere I went to what the kids were saying, so I knew where they were going. Luckily it wasn't far, so I started to jog. I'd already texted Square Jaw telling him where I'd be if he wanted to see me in one of the outfits I bought for him. I got there before he did and obviously after the two lovebirds. I hung around outside until I saw Square Jaw pull up. I texted him asking if he liked my skirt. He said yes and that he thinks green is a good color for me. I asked him about my top and he said something about how I make pink and orange look good. I told him that I was going inside for a little bit so it would look like I'm doing normal teenager things, but that I wanted him to stay outside and watch over me. I went inside and quickly found somewhere to change outfits because nothing attracts attention like two girls wearing the same thing. Just as at the mall, I stayed only to have the phone near miniskirt a little longer, but I made sure to avoid her altogether. I did this two or three more times before moving on to phase three. This was the hardest part. The plan was simple. I needed to somehow convince Miniskirt that Kix was cheating on her with me. It wasn't that unlikely since we were the same age and in the same class before I was arrested. But I knew nothing about boys. I was always a loner and I just wanted to take care of myself. So I started having conversations on the phone around her for her to overhear when I knew she wasn't on the phone with sneakers. I was basically just saying things I heard some of the girls at the detention center say. They would say it when they wanted to get another girl's man. I was flirting with nobody on the other line. I'd say things like, she's too young for you, we used to be so good together. Just any kind of crap I could remember or think of. I did this a lot near the window to her room when I knew she was home. I never used his name, but I dropped details about the classes we were in and things that happened at the school while we were there. I didn't know if it was working or not, but eventually I had to put everything into the final stage. I had been promising Squarejaw that he would sleep over soon and to be ready to come over and protect me. I got rid of everything, all the clothes, the skimmer, everything other than the phone. I was ready. I waited for a day when she and her parents were home and Squarejaw was on duty. I texted him and told him I needed him to take care of something for me and he had to come immediately. The other girl said that's what they did, so I was really hoping it would work. I then went to the window and called her out. When she stuck her head out, I told her that I've been seeing kicks and that she should just back off. I went inside and closed my window. I knew she had a temper, so I went to my front door and waited for her. I wiped down the phone and put it on the table. As soon as she knocked, I opened and she hit me in the face and started screaming and swearing at me. I'd received much worse from the dean, but I also knew how to make it look good. So when she hit me, I made sure to also hit my mouth on the table. I smiled a bloody smile and told her to check my phone and see what Kix and I had been up to. She picked it up and started scrolling through it. Obviously she was confused because all those texts were between me and Squarejaw. At that moment, her parents came in to see what was going on. That was my cue. I started crying, saying that she'd been bullying and robbing me, and that when I told her I'd call the cops, she said her boyfriend was a cop, and that she texted him to come sort me out. 
Her dad saw the phone in her hand and she claimed it wasn't hers and that she was only holding it because I said I had texts with her boyfriend. He said he didn't believe her because he saw the charges on her credit card for a new phone. He took it from her and started scrolling through the messages. It was all there. Dates and times when she went to the mall, nights that she snuck out and the outfits she was wearing. Her mom immediately recognized the outfits as her daughter's. They read through a lot of the messages about how safe she felt with him and how even when she was small she needed him. Right around that time Square Jaw showed up, his first words were, Baby, what happened? What happened next was not my intention and to this day I still regret it. Mini Skirt's dad attacked Square Jaw. In hindsight, it was obvious why he would do that, but I didn't have a dad like that growing up, so I didn't see it coming. Squarejaw lived up to his name. He took it right on the chin and then beat the crap out of her dad and arrested him for assaulting a police officer. All I hoped for was her parents to accuse him of being a creep and threaten him so that he'd be too scared to come near me again and for them to keep their daughter away from me. It took a couple of days for everything to be sorted out. Mini Skirt's mom went to the press with the phone and the texts. The cop traced his phone and cruiser and matched it to the dates and times that Mini Skirt was at those places. Mini Skirt realized that she couldn't tell her parents that she snuck out with kicks because he was 19 and she was 16, because she actually loved him, I guess. So she lied and said Square Jaw was her boyfriend. The cops let her dad go because they didn't want any more publicity, and I think her family moved away after that. Squarejaw was arrested later, but he never said anything about me because I think he knew how it would look. The city didn't want to have any issues with me, so they reduced my probation and I was allowed to leave town sooner. All in all, I'm really sorry what happened to Miniskirt's dad and maybe them having to move away, but I'm more than glad I'm free of those two nightmares. P.S. I never stole again after that. Not even Wi-Fi. P.P.S. I'm a kindergarten teacher now. Let me start off by saying that when you're in trouble, even if you feel alone, please reach out and ask for help. OP clearly had a plan and it worked out, but that plan could have gone sideways and they could have suffered a lot more harm. Another takeaway I'd pull from this is basically that, while crime worked out for OP here, crime obviously doesn't pay. I know it's cliche to say, and oftentimes the temptation to use crime and revenge is near irresistible. But really, I'd hope people could avoid relying on crime to solve difficulties. Should OP have reported the stalker police officer? If they even reported them, do you guys think the police would actually do anything about it considering they're a member of the force? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Is a run-in with an underground organization. My brother and I were raised in a foster home by the greatest woman on earth. We called her mom. She was old enough to be our grandmother, but she raised us like her sons, and she was our mother. My brother and I aren't biologically related, but we were both well-loved by the same woman, and that made us brothers. My brother was born deaf and given up for adoption, and although he was younger than me, he was much smarter than me. He was taken in first, so the two of them learned sign language together. When I joined the family, he was like the older brother, showing me the ropes around the house and teaching me to sign. He was four and I was about six at the time. My parents had just died and mom took me in. I was really well loved, so I didn't act out as much as the other kids do in my situation. Over time, I grew into my role as the older brother, protecting him from the other children and just helping him navigate the audible world. But like I said, he is way smarter than me, so I learned a lot more from him than he learned from me. I still do. We did everything together, went to school, played sports, got into fights, hung out with girls. We were a team. He wanted to go to college. He loved history and engineering and he wanted to do some sort of hybrid thing about the technology and weapons of the ancient world. I don't know, that stuff was way beyond me. And I certainly wasn't getting the grades to go to real college, never mind anywhere he got into. And I was okay with that. Our guidance counselors all wanted him to apply for scholarships and he definitely had what it takes to get a full ride. He said no, he'd go where I went and all that was left was community college. The truth was, we couldn't afford it, but mom made me promise to make sure he goes to college one way or the other. So when I graduated, I started working to save up money for the two of us to go to community college together. 
I was doing odd jobs, a little bit of construction, work on cars, body work, repairs, stuff like that. After about a year, my brother suggested that I start a business so that I would be intentional about what I was doing. And since he's pretty much always right about these things, I did. Having a business helped me get more gigs and I was making a bit more money, but it wasn't nearly enough for both of us to study. Not even at night. Mom died just before he finished high school. She left the house, which wasn't very big, but in this economy, it was a huge thing. My brother joined me in the business and that really helped move things along. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. Sweet, you got a house. Why not use it as leverage to get a student loan? We're poor, not stupid. Well, my brother isn't. We'd seen what the banks were doing in our community with people who put up their houses as collateral. We were young and strong. We could work. We weren't going to risk our mother's house. Fast forward a year, the business was doing well and we managed to land a pretty nice construction contract. It required us to use some of our savings to buy a truck and some extra tools, but the payday would have put us at more than 80% of our goal to study full time. On the night before we were supposed to start, we met with the client at their property, just going over some last minute details. It was late when we were approaching the intersection into our neighborhood, the light was green as we approached, and I continued to cross the intersection, then the world went sideways and black. I opened my eyes in the hospital, and already I saw all of our savings vanish down the black hole called healthcare. My brother wasn't there, and suddenly all the money in the world couldn't have mattered less. I started thrashing in panic, which made the nurses come in. I was crying, asking about my brother, and they told me he'll be back during visiting hours. He'd been coming every day for the three days I'd been in the hospital. I hurt my back and got some sort of brain injury, which is why I was out for three days. When my brother finally came, he looked livid. Someone ran the red light and plowed straight through the back of our truck. Because of that, we were obviously not able to get our job, and the client fired us and threatened to sue because now his project was delayed. It's not like we planned on getting our primary business asset totaled and me hospitalized, but none of that mattered. So now we had no truck, our tools were scattered across the road for homeless guys to pawn, I was injured, and we had massive hospital bills. But the best news of the day was that it was a hit and run. The guy was driving one of those armored SUVs. He went through our truck like it was drywall. The one thing he lost was his fender and a license plate, and this was the cause of all our future problems. Because we had one or two run-ins with the law, the police weren't all that eager to help my brother. We didn't do anything serious, we just got into a couple of street fights every now and then. But still, the cops weren't trying to hear anything from my brother. By the time I woke up in the hospital, it made sense why. My brother had taken a photo of the license plate, just in case the cops were the usual incompetent cells. He followed up with the cops the same day we got fired from our contract because we had no other jobs lined up for at least six weeks. So we wanted to find the driver to get his details for the insurance because the hospital fees were going to have us broke soon. They brushed off, but he went back the next day and they were even more intent on not helping him. He decided to go look for the driver himself. He went around to some of the body shops we had done work for and said that he heard about an accident involving an SUV and wanted to know if he could pick up some work. He eventually found the car and learned who the owner was. It belonged to the son of one of the connected families in the city, which explained why the cops wanted nothing to do with it. When my brother told me this, I said let's just walk away and just start over. That's when he lost it. While I'm normally the one with the hair trigger, my brother's temper was unmatched when got set off. So I tried calming him down just to get a sense of the situation. He wasn't having it. When he gets like that, his signing is like a one-man slap fight. And because his shoulder was hurt, he was doing the sign equivalent of slurring. It was hard to keep up with, but the gist of it was this. Everything we saved up will dry up in the next few weeks and then we'll still spend the next 10 years paying off your hospital bill. That's if you can even work again. And then, and only then, can we start thinking about college. Meanwhile, the other guy goes about his life like none of this ever happened. He'll probably pay for his car's repair work with cash he keeps in his ashtray. It didn't seem fair the more I thought about it, but what were our options? I suggested we go talk to them and ask for a little compensation. That we won't press charges or anything. 
My brother's response was to ask, since when were two bullets more expensive than a used truck and hospital bills? So I gave in and asked him if he had a plan. He did. The way he saw it, they were going to pay us either way, but we were also going to get even. The plan was to ask for normal work, like the kind of work we've been doing. They were going to underpay us, that's just the way things worked with them. But we hoped that because of our reputation, they might think to approach us for some extra jobs on the side. That's where we were looking to make back our money. And while that was happening, we thought we might learn a thing or two to give to the feds or the papers. Make them hurt like they hurt us. In hindsight, things like that only happen in movies. I was discharged after spending a week in the hospital. Apparently my back took more damage than my brain, but I was still able to walk. All the regular problems that came with back injuries became my new best friends. No heavy lifting, so there goes my regular work. Physiotherapy, like I could afford that. And the occasional bouts of excruciating pain, but I was willing to tough it out. We approached a couple of the guys from the neighborhood that we knew work for this family, but they were more on the fringes. They were able to get us a meeting with someone who can make the decisions that will get us jobs. The guy who eventually started handing us jobs wasn't near the top of the organization, but you could call him the operator of the legitimate side of the business. It started off with a few pickup jobs on construction sites, but at half the rate we normally charge our clients. We did good work, and that rarely goes unnoticed. This eventually led to us being taken to job sites in residential areas where we were asked to case some homes, give details on the comings and goings of the residents, and even the layout and potential vulnerabilities of the home. This led to late night stripping of cars and the occasional delivery of packages. Things became serious when we were asked to make a collection. It was the kind of opportunity we were hoping for, something that would get us on the inside. So we took it. It went well, people paid. My brother and I weren't small guys and we already had a bit of a reputation. But I think what really convinced people was that we were an odd pair. He'd stand there, mute, glaring at them, and I'd sign him all their excuses. We'd have a conversation in front of them, and then I'd turn to them and apologize, saying my brother wasn't happy with their reasons, so I'd leave them to him. They paid. We didn't need to do that bit, because my brother was an exceptional lip reader. He just enjoyed people not knowing and underestimating him. Of course, one day we had to make good on our word when someone decided they're not going to pay. This changed everything. He was an old man we knew from around the neighborhood. He bet on anything and everything. We had paid him a visit once before and he promised us the money. Most of the time we were reasonable and gave them a day or two, especially if we knew them. In this case, he lied to us. Someone saw him at the dog track making a lot of bets. A lot of losing bets with money he wasn't supposed to have. So we made another house call. Going in, we knew we were going to hurt him. In our minds, he brought it on himself. First, he lied to us. He took advantage of our generosity and then lost the money we were supposed to collect. Second, he was a degenerate anyway. What was he doing with his life? We were trying to build something, make something of ourselves. He was just wasting away his family's chance at a better life. We went in thinking that and broke every bone in his left hand, his forearm, and dislocated his shoulder. We got our money three days later, and no one ever tried that with us again. This got us in the room with people who made decisions. We still weren't near the walking phallus who totaled our truck, but we started to learn things about the organization. By this point, we'd almost made back all the money we lost. We weren't spending it on chains, booze, or women. We had a goal, and we were sticking to it. But the sweet nectar that was to be our vengeance was starting to drip into our hands. Well, into my brother's hands. Because people knew he was deaf, but didn't know about the lip reading, they tended to say things in front of him when I wasn't around. I'd be in the toilet or forget something in the car or whatever reason I could think of to leave the room, and tiny morsels of info would drift my brother's way. We kept a journal of everything he saw. Names of people, places, products, scores, scams, whatever they mentioned. Then one day, someone mentioned a time and place that a particular illicit activity was going to take place. We saw this as our opportunity to get the press or the cops involved. By this time, something in my brother had changed. He'd show a calm face when he was around them. 
but as soon as we were alone, his rage was torrential. He wanted to hurt all of them, not just the boss's son. I didn't know what to do, and I went along hoping he'd snap out of it. He saw this new information as a chance to bring other players into the game, ones who would make better use of this info. We were careful to hide our tracks and stay anonymous, but we made sure that the time and place of the gathering fell into the hands of individuals who cared a little for the organization. It was a one-night-only, high-stakes, underground poker tournament. By all rights, we didn't know about it, so obviously we weren't invited. But a rumor made its way to some armed men who happily picked the place clean. There were no casualties that night, but the cage was rattled. We went about our normal routine, making collections, working sites, and asking no questions. We get summoned by a decision maker who tells us that due to recent events, the organization had to recompense some very serious individuals that had put a strain on the cash flow. We were to start making collections from some larger account holders and to do so ahead of schedule. The amounts we were to collect would have taken us 10 years to make, but we showed up, made some veiled threats, and came back a few days later for a large bag of cash. About the third such collection, my brother's rage began to surface again. We would be able to afford much more than community college with just one bag that we collected. If we did that, we'd be dead men or on the run for the rest of our lives. We needed a scapegoat. There was another pair of guys who also did collections like we were. My brother happened to be in the room when they got one of their assignments. It was a fat bag they were collecting as well. We surreptitiously passed this information along to the individuals who unwittingly served us the last time. The plan was to do our collection on the same day as them and claim that we were done in just as they were. We did the collection and then beat the heck out of each other before hiding the money. We then showed up looking pitiful, only to hear the news that our colleagues suffered a fate worse than ours. We pretended to be shocked and outraged, of course, and corroborated what the witnesses saw. The organization struck that night. It was a massacre. A week later, my brother and I went in to say that we were out, that we had just wanted to get back on our feet, and that the violence was more than we could take. They did not take kindly to that. We were told that once we're in, we're in for life. The mood in the room was a little more than awkward. We were offered an escort out of the building and a ride home. Nobody was pointing guns yet and we weren't carrying, but we were confident we could still muscle our way out once we were on the street. My brother was the first one out of the building and the first to get shot. It seems that some of the individuals whom the organization tried to deal with survived the assault and chose to retaliate. The son of the head of the organization showed up at my brother's funeral to pay his respects and to let me know that out of respect for what happened to my brother, the organization allowed me to walk away. He didn't recognize me. How could he? But there he was standing in front of me. And right there, I realized what actually killed my brother. I left and went to college to study psychology to become a counselor. I realized that I failed my brother when I didn't see how much pain he was in over mom's death. I didn't help him grieve in a healthy way, and that led us both down a dark path. I can only pray that what I do now helps prevent a repeat of our history. I'm not gonna lie, when I got into the story, I was kind of lost in it. It was like a reading what went down in like a really entertaining Sopranos episode. Do you think you'd be enticed to do something crazy or harmful to another person when you could stand to walk away with thousands and thousands of dollars? Or do you think that's just ridiculous? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. And our final story of the day is avocados and a court case. My neighbor and I have been at war for years. I don't know who started it, but I ended it. The whole thing started with a tree. My neighbor had a massive tree in his yard that would shed like a kid with dandruff scratching his head. The tree was a menace. It stood on the boundary fence between our houses and towered over each one. When shedding season came along, I spent almost every weekend either cleaning my pool or cleaning my gutters. The pool was less of a concern than the gutters. We'd get a lot of rain in the fall, and the last thing you want is clogged gutters. As much as I hated it, there wasn't much I could do about it. It was a big tree and my neighbor didn't control where the leaves fell. The problem was, it was also a fruit-bearing tree, and my neighbor wanted all the avocados that grew on his tree, even the ones that hung over and fell on my side of the fence. 
Now, if he had offered to clean my pool and gutters, used his own garbage bags and tools to clean up after his tree, I'd have said, sure, take your avos. But he didn't. This may or may not have had something to do with the fact that as children, my brother and I were quite rowdy. We rode our bikes in the street and may have broken a window or two playing hockey in our backyard. Whatever the reason, he insisted that nature was nature and that he didn't control it, but that the tree was on his land so the fruit were his. Now, depending on where you live, the law has various things to say about this. But where I'm from, the law was pretty clear. If the leaves fall on your side, you clean it. And if the fruit even so much as hangs into your property, it's yours. He didn't want to hear any of that, so we handled it like all neighborly people in the world would. We went to court. He sued me first, but he was cheap on top of everything else. He chose to file the entire action himself. I obviously had a countersuit which went through attorneys. The law on procedure is apparently clear on this that once you have an attorney, all papers should be filed with them. But this Nimrod decided to appear at my house at unreasonable hours to serve the various documents for the case. So before we could actually hear the matter regarding the tree, we first had to go to the motion court to stop him from serving on me firstly, and then coming to my house at ungodly hours. We won that fight but the costs for it were pushed onto the actual case about the tree. When Matter finally appeared before a judge, he presented the most ludicrous argument for why he should keep his avos, but not have to clean up the leaves, but also that we had to collect them and turn them over to him. He also demanded that we pay him for all the avos that we kept that fell into our yard. The judge disagreed and said that either he should clean them up and collect them or let it all go. All the costs came to us. Yay? No. He never came to clean up or collect, nor did he pay the costs of our attorneys. Instead, he said that since we've been getting the avos for free, we can deduct them from our costs. He still demanded that the avos that fell into our yard should be returned to him. And back to court we went. I don't know how the judge was able to stay so calm while explaining to a grown man why he couldn't use avocados that fell into someone else's yard to pay off legal fees that he owed them, and that demanding the avos be returned to him was in defiance of a court order. So the judge ordered him to pay us again, but this time they ordered that the portion of the tree that hangs over into our yard be removed at his expense. Yay? No. Remember when I said that he was cheap? Well, he was really, really cheap. He decided to do the trimming himself from his yard. So the next week, while my wife and I were at work and my children were at school, he got onto his ladder and into the tree and started sawing away at the branches. The branches that extend over the roof of my house. I came home to a new skylight. It rained that week. We spent the next six weeks living at my brother's place while the roof was fixed and the floors redone. We didn't have any furniture for the next six months. And back to court we went. His argument this time was that he didn't have a choice because he wasn't allowed to come into my yard due to the court order from the first case stating that he can't serve papers on me anymore. The judge wasn't amused. He was ordered to pay for the damages to the house and the cost of anything that was damaged in the house by the rain. Yay? No. Cheap, remember? He wanted receipts and invoices for materials and labor and for when the house was first built, because that was the cost of the damages. He also wanted receipts for the stuff in the house damaged by the rain. Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to court we go. And now the judge had to explain to a grown man why the claim for damages comes from the cost of repairs, and the furniture and things had to be replaced at the price they cost today, not the price they were bought at, which is what the amount in the original court order accounted for. We got our costs. This time it seems like he didn't have the money. He still hadn't paid off the full cost from the last two matters. His options were to have a garnishee order on his salary, or to sell his assets. His only asset was his house. He chose to have the garnishee on his salary, which meant that every month, until everything was paid back to us, 30% of his salary was going to come to me. There was no way he was getting around this order, and it was going to take years to pay it all off. In the meantime, we got some nice new furniture, and the value of the house went up because of the repairs done. This didn't improve the relationship, of course. 
He was careful not to speak to any of my family as he knew we weren't afraid to go to court. And it also seems that the system was on our side. But things started happening soon after that. It was innocuous at first. My garden hose went missing and some of my gardening tools. The tires on both my wife's and my car went flat around the same time. We found nails in all of them. My tool shed was broken into and stuff was taken. And then there were the noises outside my children's bedrooms. I knew it was him, but I had no way of proving it. My family was beginning to feel unsafe and my wife was talking about moving out. That was not an option for me. I grew up in this house and I wasn't leaving. I decided to increase the security around my house and get a dog as well. The incident stopped, everyone was happy again, and my children even more so because now they had a dog. Until one morning we woke up and found the dog poisoned. That was it for me. I had been toying with the idea for a while and I never really considered doing it until that morning. That same day, I went out and bought some poison that I read about while doing my research. Over the next few weeks, I'd go into my yard late at night and start exposing the roots of the tree that had come under the fence onto my side. I'd water the area around the roots and dig out the wet sand until the root had nothing to hold on to. I made sure to cover them with fake grass so that it didn't show. I also began loosening the ground near the fence so the fence would give way. I'd then sneak over to his side and poison the roots of the tree on his side. After a few weeks, the tree began dying on his side of the fence, and the roots on my side were completely exposed. The tree started leaning, and one day there was a loud boom. The tree fell onto the house and demolished it. He had to move away into some place he could afford, minus the 30% of his salary, he still pays me. Over the past few years, I've actually read a few stories involving neighbors and trees and fruit trees. One thing I've learned is don't mess with a neighbor's tree because tree law can be pretty darn serious depending on where you're at. As far as all the stories I've heard, I think OP's laws here are pretty generous. And I think OP was just lucky that the neighbor had literally no money left to do anything with because if they caught on, maybe they could have done something against OP, but they probably didn't have any money to bring it to court again. Getting back at an awful two-faced manager. I'm equal parts mortified and equal parts relieved to be reliving this rather dramatic time in my life. But my best friend dared me to do it, and I've been chicken enough in my life, so here goes. When I was 25, I'm 29 now, I worked in this really hippie type event planning slash marketing company, and I was employed under the design and content marketing extension of the company. And although we were seven, my team was a close-knit group. You know, the sort of team to hang out on Fridays after work and invite each other for kickbacks over the weekend. The team was fun and the atmosphere was vibrant, so naturally I absolutely loved it. I was working as a graphic designer slash content creator for the company, so my workload was quite the pile as you would imagine, but it was never something that made me want to puke at the thought of going to work the next day. To sum it up, my life was somewhere close to perfect, or at least as I could be content with, until she stepped into it and messed everything up. About 8 months after I got employed at the company, my line manager resigned because he got a better offer and we were all heartbroken. But he had to leave for better opportunities and we all understood. In fact, at some point, I was looking forward to the new manager because I'd heard that she was a woman and I was super excited to see how the dynamics of working directly with a female boss would be, considering that our top management and founders were all men. But my expectations were definitely too high and I didn't realize that until much, much, much later. Anyway, let me get back to the gist of the story. A week after B officially left the company, we met the new manager. Let's call her L because she's the world's biggest loser. L got to know everyone pretty quickly and we would later learn that she devoted so much effort into getting to know us because she wanted to be able to exploit individual weaknesses. L had been working with us for a month No drama, no worries, and just a ton of questions and criticism. But then came the first quarterly review meeting with her as a manager. So here's a little explainer about our quarterly meetings. At the company, we had three CEOs, two were co-founders, while one was more of a CFO than a CEO. The two co-founders were quite annoying because they were more or less investors who had bought the idea for the company and funded it with professionals without truly understanding the details. 
and B had been a buffer for us at these quarterly meetings because he prepped us for loopholes they may try to poke at to audit our performance, and he was good at highlighting all the work we were doing right. I'm not saying we were slackers, but the co-founders are notorious micromanagers, and it could be a maze to try and draw their attention to the true objective of our work as opposed to whatever they assume we should have been looking out for. B was the one who could field their million and one questions and emphasize that our work had met the required standards for the month as opposed to whatever BS they decided in the moment was to be our focus. And this usually helped our individual reviews at the end of the meeting because the CEOs couldn't find anything to indicate his bad quality. The only reasonable person on the main board was the CEO CFO guy and because he was an employee at the end of the day. There wasn't much he could do but roll his eyes and sigh along with us when one of the evil twins, as my team called the co-founders, mentioned something redundant. So anyway, back to L's first blow with the team. We were at the first quarterly meeting with the CEOs and she must have gotten the gist that the co-founders had money, but didn't get the gist that they had more money than common sense. When they started shooting questions at us about the Thanksgiving and Halloween events and content we were pushing out, one of them actually said that we should try to infuse monochromatic pastel designs into the Thanksgiving bits. Everyone started the usual dance of looking at each other, sighing and subtly rolling eyes, but L, under some misguided impression that they were right, turned to me and said, That's what I said, isn't it? I must have looked as confused as I felt, because she started snapping her fingers in front of my face and I had to ask her to repeat herself. Of course, she didn't take that kindly, and then she went on and on about how she had the idea for pastel Thanksgiving and neutral tone Halloween designs, but that I and the rest of the team had disagreed with her. Never mind that those were the exact ideas that Dumbo number one had just spat on the table. Even the CEO slash CFO had the wildest look on his face because he knew that the team's performance as a whole hinged on the manager's direction but she definitely made the co-founders happy. After all, they were used to B's constant defense, and L was positively glowing in their praise. After the CEOs left the meeting, L turned to us and said, Those two are not the brightest bulbs, right guys? And everyone just stared in total silence. Like, what just actually happened? But she either didn't pick up on the mood of the room, or she just didn't care because in the next breath, She started the team quarterly meeting and was praising us in the worst way possible. Seriously, I kid you not, she was commending our efforts with the sindest rude remarks. It felt like a whiplash because the first month hadn't really been intense and we were halfway through her second month of the company without so much as a complaint. But suddenly it was, good job Stacy, but if you need to replenish your creative juice, just let me know and we can brainstorm better ideas because this isn't all that. One hour later and the absurd meeting was over, but the drama had just started. Our monthly performance reviews came in after the quarterly meeting, and while I hadn't thought about it, I wasn't surprised to find a note stating that there was a 15% drop in my performance rating from the previous quarter, alongside a comment about insubordination. It was L's remark during the meeting that caused it, and I was certain of it. But I didn't want to be a pot stirrer simply because someone was trying to find their footing within the company. And the next month, my performance review was unaffected, but someone else's was. Actually, three people. And because we'd spoken about it in a private group chat, we all knew who was behind it. L, the new manager. So the three of them did what I wasn't able to do. They went to her and complained about her remarks on their performance reviews, which were point blank false. And she listened to them and told them that it was probably just a misunderstanding. But she knew what she was doing, and by the next morning, all three of them had queries from the HR. Elle told the HR that they were questioning her authority unfairly and trying to make her align with the former manager's, B's, ideals. She mentioned how one of them was skipping out on work. He was taking night classes and skipped days for tests, but the mistake he made was telling her, and she said that she thought heavy medication was affecting another's performance. Poor girl has PCOS. Of course, her reasons were BS, but she CC'd the CEO in the email, and because she was practically the teacher's pet at that point, a minimal investigation was demanded and HR had to take action on the query immediately. It ended in the unpaid suspension of the three of them for a week. Crap got real fast. 
There we were, having to pick up the slack for three key members of the team and wondering which of us would be the next target for the devious manager. Telling her about our personal lives was the first mistake, but underestimating how devious she could be was the biggest mistake. Two months after the quarterly meeting that started the whole thing, we had an in-house pitch presentation for the top management in view of one major client that was considering us for a long-term project. I was headlining the pitch because of the nature of the project, and I'd created the pitch deck with input from our marketing and primary content persons. I got up to the projector, did my thing, got approving nods from my team members and the CFO, and surprisingly, the evil twins didn't look like they had a lot to add or they were probably bored. But when Elle noticed that the co-founders were not throwing endless and meaningless questions, she stood up. And that is the idea I gave the team to work with. Thank you for that presentation. I'll handle any questions. The room was silent. Er, um, what? I had no words to respond with. I was still in a shocked daze when I took my seat. And in the next minute or so, the co-founders were cheering for Elle and praising her efforts as a great leader for letting me present the pitch. And I was staring a hole in her head, but she was doing everything to ignore me. Until the meeting ended, of course. The evil twins told Elle that she would be joining them to pitch to the client in a few weeks. And she was smiling like a Cheshire cat through it all. My team members all looked at me with pity, but they understood what the implication for challenging her would be. When I got home from work, I ranted to my best friend, and just like she pushed me to talk about this, she pushed me to confront Elle. So I asked for a meeting with Elle. I explained that I understood that she needed time to adjust to the dynamics of the company, but I would appreciate it if she stopped undermining my work and that of the other team members. And she all but laughed in my face. Sweetheart, I know you feel like you got cheated out of this presentation like your boyfriend cheated on you. I sucked in a breath and steeled my stomach because that was a hard blow, but I knew she wasn't done. But you need to understand that the more I look good to those idiots at the top, the better for the team. It's just the way things work. And I went back to work, and it continued like that for another two months. The team would put in work for something, she would wait to see the evil twin's reaction, and then swoop in to steal the shine or throw someone away under the bus. But when it came to a performance review for my promotion, I knew I couldn't let things go as they were. I needed a great shot for an upward review of my salary, but I knew I couldn't get it if she was still adamant on blocking my progress and that of the rest of the team. So I spoke to my best friend about it, and she convinced me that the best thing to do was to knock Elle off her game. And I knew I couldn't tell the rest of my team because everyone was trying to protect their positions. Meanwhile, I knew that I was either getting a promotion or getting the heck out of there. My revenge plan was set, and I knew it was only a matter of time. Elle liked sucking up to the CEOs, but she liked trolling them even better. So I waited till the next time we had a meeting with them and approached her after the meeting. My phone was set to record in my pants. I started with a harmless remark about the meeting and she took it as the opening. Sometimes I wonder who gave these two idiots the money to make such decisions. Over the next few weeks, I started these kinds of conversations with her, recording every time she made a snide comment and waiting for the perfect chance for my bullseye shot. But I knew Elle was smart, so I decided to go for a long shot. I came up with a document containing screenshots of text where she had insulted the CEOs and added some empty gibberish text to a different document. She was lazy, except for when she was throwing everyone else on the ground to make her way to the top. So I knew she wouldn't spare a long glance at the document. I waited for her to be in a heated discussion with one of the team members and brought the gibberish doc to her. Hi L, I need this authorized for an update to the milestones on the project. She took a single look at the bold heading, flipped the pages mindlessly, signed and dated the document, and went back to berating the designer she was speaking to. I immediately scanned her signature, placed it on a version of the document without the gibberish text, and sent it off to the CEOs. I attached the audio recordings of her snide remarks and waited for heck to let loose. About 30 minutes later, I heard a repeated, no, 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 from her office. And while my team members peeked their heads out to look at what was going on, I was trying hard not to laugh in my cubicle. By the next day, the CEO stopped by for a quick chat with L and the head of HR. When they verified her signature and voice on the recordings, they suspended her indefinitely. 
I came clean to the team and encouraged them to tell HR about Elle's behavior. Our explanations confirmed their suspicion. Most of them had worked with us while B was around, and they mentioned that the co-founders wouldn't have done anything about her incompetency if it hadn't become clear that she was disrespecting them. But the underdogs won, and she was fired at the end of that week. I didn't get promoted, but I got the satisfaction of watching her pack up her office with security, looking over her shoulder the entire time. And all was well in my world once again. Also, I got a job offer at the firm that B moved to, which was the perfect ending to the very dramatic turn of events in my professional life. Do you guys think this story stands as proof that if you're going to make yourself look super good to the bosses, but you're actually behind their backs, trashing them, trashing the people you work with, etc., that eventually at some point you're going to slip up and it's going to make you pay? Or would you think it's possible for people like this to stick around for a long time, maybe an entire career, doing this awful two-faced stuff? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And by the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every video has awesome stories, like our final story of the day, Revenge Against My Scum of the Earth Father. Just one thing before you start reading this, I have no remorse about what I did and how I did it. My only regret is that I waited so long to do it. My mother loved me and I loved her, and we both hated my father, at least for as long as I can remember. But the villain in the story is actually not my dad. I think it's the universe because I can't believe how unfortunate my mother and I were to be related or involved with someone like him. But I'm jumping the gun a bit, let me take it back a bit. The first time my dad hit me, I was 10 years old and it was my birthday. I know this sounds heavily cinematic, but there's a level of BS that you go through in life that everything else pales in comparison. And I went through nine rings of this heck. My mother baked a cake. I was so psyched and I had friends over. My baby brother was four years old and getting in everyone's way, but it wasn't an issue then. Later, it would be the biggest trigger. Why did I get hit? Well, my dad was sitting in his office drinking his regular bottle of beer, grooming a drinking problem I was too young to recognize. I went in to give him a slice of my birthday cake, but I tripped, and the cake splashed on his rug and shoes. Before I could stand up and apologize, he slapped me so hard that I felt my neck snap. I couldn't process what happened, and before I came to, he had locked his office door, and I was standing in the hallway with tears on my face. That's how my mom found me. The next time my dad hit me, I was 13 and he'd lost his job. I had the unfortunate luck, story of my life, to have been the first person to enter the house after he had been fired for inappropriate conduct at work, as I would later find out. And the fact that I was smiling as I locked the door behind myself was too much for him, so he slapped me and dragged my shirt to the room I shared with my 7-year-old brother. He locked me in there for the rest of the day, and it was when my mom got back that she opened the door. You're probably wondering what my mom told me the first time he hit me. Well, it was the same thing she said the second time, and every other time for the next four years. Your dad's dealing with things we don't really understand. Just stay out of his way and you'll be alright. So the abuse continued, and I tried my best to stay out of his way and keep my younger brother out of his way. But two years later, when I was 15, he hit me and he hit my brother too. What did we do? Well, our baby brother, who was barely six months at this time, was crying and he couldn't sleep after a long day of searching for a way to feed the family, which was basically drunk speak for a day of drinking. Anyway, the baby was crying, my younger brother was playing with trucks, and he couldn't stand the noise. So he brought his belt to our room and gave my younger brother two whips. He gave me 20 because I dared to pull the trembling nine-year-old away from him. I bled from gashes in my back that night, and although I was old enough to question it, I was still the kid who wanted to help my mother by simply staying out of his way. So I told my younger brother what she told me, and snuck him out to get ice cream and avoid pissing the man off even further. At that point, I was certain that he wasn't my dad, not in the way that mattered. A week later, I realized that it was worse than I thought. I was turning 16 and excited that I would be able to work and help my mother out. She was doing two shifts at three jobs and getting back at 10 p.m. every day with a baby that was exhausted from crying all day and barely holding herself upright. The owner of the grocery store at the corner had promised to employ me when I turned 16. 
and I was so close to it that I had an extra skip in my step. So you can't really blame me for not picking up the signs as soon as I got back from school. But now that I think back on it, I should have noticed that my mom's keys were in the key holder when she should have been at work. And the house reeked of alcohol, so that meant my father was home too. But none of that registered until I heard my mother shout. I ran to their bedroom door, but it was locked, and the familiar sounds of his belt and her screams were all I needed to know. A few minutes later, she stepped out, and I knew she wasn't expecting me to be home. That night, after we stepped out to meet with friends, and my baby brother went over to the neighbor's place to play, she grabbed my youngest brother, the toddler, and we went to a diner, and she spilled her guts all over the table between us. She told me about the first time he hit her, shortly after they got married and had me. Then she apologized for all the mornings when she stayed in bed extra late, and I had to make breakfast and get my brother ready for school and look after the toddler. She was fixing whatever obvious injury she had to make sure I wouldn't ask questions. Over and over, she kept talking about how I was such a good boy and how I did so well to help her out and she knew I was excited about starting the job at the grocery store and blah blah blah. As shocking as her revelation was, I didn't think anything could have been worse than watching that man whip my baby brother. So we went back home after about two hours. He wasn't back yet, and that made everything feel a little better. And that was the beginning of a new routine in my life. My mom would stay longer in bed on some days, and I would tell my very curious younger brother that she was exhausted from working so hard. And when he asked why daddy wasn't working as hard, I would tell him that daddy was doing his best. But while I worked and studied to get to that point, I was shielding my brothers from the physical and emotional abuse doing extra of my mom's part to prevent my brothers from being neglected in the worst way possible. And it worked. At first it did anyway. I got promoted at the grocery store, went to community college, and started my own little lawn mowing and landscaping business with just myself, my close friend, and my brother doing the tasks. Well, my brother was more of an assistant than anything, but anywhere was better than having him stay at the house for longer than necessary with the man. But I was living a double life because, as an adult, it became clearer to me that my mom saw me as a crutch, and if she had full access to all I was doing and how much I was making, I would have to fund the man's lifestyle. I apologize if this gets dark, but you must know that this man was the scum that gave birth to all the scum on earth, and I'm really trying not to get into the specifics of what he did so that I don't trigger people with dealing with PTSD about this stuff. When he was employed, the man's drinking made him mean. When he was poor, his drinking made him worse than the devil. And by the time I was 20, I had enough credits to finish college in a year. And my business got an investment offer. One of the old men I frequently helped out cleared a check from his pension and wanted to help me. But I knew scaling wouldn't be easy if we were still living with the man. But for the first time, fate was in my favor. Seven years after he lost his job and failed at everything relating to a productive life, my alcoholic father finally completed the cycle of deadbeat dadness. He up and left, but he took everything with him. Literally. I got a call right after one of my finals, and it was my 14-year-old brother calling to tell me that he couldn't find our 5-year-old brother. I was making enough to help mom with the younger kids, but she still held down multiple jobs so she could handle all the house-related things and not cause suspicion from the man. So our five-year-old brother had a simple rule. If he was left alone at home, he was to lock the door and not open it for anyone till he heard any of our voices. And he was a pretty obedient kid, so I knew something was off right off the bat. I told my younger brother to call the cops, but also check the back of the house, in case the kid had wandered off due to boredom. I raced home and found my younger brother in tears. Long story short, the man had cleared out the house, save for a few of our clothing and documents, but everything else was gone. By the time my mom got home, it was no longer an assumption but a fact. He had robbed us and skipped town. The cops were naturally furious at my mom and threatened to call CPS, but I intervened and said that I was responsible for the missing kid because she had informed me about her schedule and I promised to look after him. I didn't see any reason why my mom should have to deal with losing most of her items and having to be separated from her children, which is exactly what would have happened if the cops knew the full details. Later that night, as we huddled in front of the house, after hours of searching for my youngest brother, the kid turned up at the house. 
He had run out of the house when the man came and started screaming for some men to take everything, and he was scared that they were going to take him. So, he hid in our neighbor's garage, but slept off and was only found when our neighbor was trying to park his car. That was one crisis averted, and I saw the man's theft as a blessing in disguise. I could focus on rebuilding our lives, and I was determined enough to achieve it, and I did. I got the first investment and more kept rolling in, and my life went on an upward rise from there. My mother died about two years after the man stole all our possessions. She was hit by a drunk driver and didn't survive. So I became the legal guardian of my brothers and I moved them out of the house with haunted memories. Anyway, to the revenge bit. I turned 30 earlier this year and I currently employ 20 young people with similar backgrounds at my landscaping company. My life's pretty good right now, but it got even better when I was on an out-of-state trip a few months ago to meet a client, and I saw the man cuddling up to a pile of trash near the outskirts of the state I was visiting. He was almost unrecognizable, but you don't really forget an abuser's face. So I had no issues identifying him. And aside from my first thought of trash remaining trash, I knew he had to pay for what he did to my entire life and to the people I loved but I didn't want to get tied up in anything unnecessarily criminal. I have two young men that I'm responsible for, so I called up an old client that was so insufferable, even female staff members refused to work with her. I told her a situation with a bum that needed some work, but wouldn't mind no pay as long as he got some food. But I knew she was truly a vile person who always tried to convince my staff to accept less pay than they deserve. So it felt only right that the man should work tirelessly for someone so ruthless. I got one of my close friends to approach him. I couldn't risk getting recognized and offer him the job. An alcoholic with no job, family, house or possessions? Of course he jumped at the opportunity. And every day I intentionally drove by my former client's house. The look of utter dejection on his face filled with a dark urge in my mind. I was getting ready to leave him to whatever treatment she gave him, but then, like a nasty rash, he wouldn't leave my existence. He fell ill and slumped because she had him do some work on her second floor windows while it was raining, and of course, she didn't want to be responsible for him. She threatened to report him to the cops, but I didn't want him to get charged with a misdemeanor and end up without any actual suffering. So I told her to drop him off at an elite hospital and that it would be best if she mentioned that he was a stranger she picked up on the road and left no personal information behind, except my number in place of hers, just so I could confirm that he was admitted to the hospital. To be honest, this rant slash spill slash recap has spent a long time in my drafts, but I finally got word from the hospital last week aka they called to inform me that the initial tests showed a possible tumor and they wanted to confirm my contact information to which i promptly denied with a strong wrong number so it felt like the time was right to clear this off my mind and clear him off my life he'll be coherent in a few days maybe and be able to tell him his personal information or whatever remains alcohol hasn't soaked up and I would be none the wiser while he gets caught up in an endless string of debts. I know they say revenge is best served cold, but I didn't expect that a literal cold from the rain would help me. He hurt my loved ones, and now he's going to drown in a sea of debt. Or whatever, to be honest. I lost all feeling for him when I lost my mother, and I just want to build my business and help my brothers enjoy a life I couldn't. This overall did culminate in a really good revenge, but in a way, it's almost a disappointing commentary on the US healthcare system. At least I'm assuming this took place in the US. Like the fact that this guy got sick, ended up in the hospital, and ended up having a tumor, being the reason that this guy is going to end up with an endless string of debts because he's homeless, is really, when you take a step back, just a disappointing realization of the American healthcare system in general. I mean, it's good revenge, it's the kind of thing a guy like that deserves, you know, struggling, broke, endless debts. But the fact alone that it was them having a tumor and getting medical assistance being the reason that he just instantly accrues this endless debt, in a way it's almost disappointing. I sent my own mom to prison. My sixth birthday was somehow the best and worst day of my life. It was 1985. Birthdays were one of the few okay days for me and my little sister growing up. 
Dad usually risked my mom's wrath, gently and cleverly persuading her that a birthday party would make us look good, and that would usually get her begrudging approval. Mom was obsessed with her image. The parties themselves were never anything fancy, a bit of cake, musical chairs, and a few balloons, but it was enough. It was nice to just have a day where tension wasn't constantly simmering at home. My sixth started off on a really good note. Most of my dad's family, i.e. the nice ones, had managed to come. As for mom's side, the ones I didn't like much either hadn't bothered, were ill, or were busy. I didn't get off scot-free though. I remember cringing when I heard grouchy old Uncle Arnie's stick rapping on the front door. God, that guy can make a clown convention feel like a funeral. Despite that, the party went pretty well, leading up to the arrival of the birthday cake. My mom set it down on the coffee table, next to the ashtray, whilst everyone finished singing the famous song, the one I can't even bear to hear anymore. What happened next was one of those surreal moments that you never want to believe, but have to because you can't run away from the truth. I sucked in all the air that my little lungs could carry and blew them out. Well, it took a couple more goes, but I got there in the end. Then, and it couldn't have been more than a minute later, my dad collapsed his head hitting our old armchair as he went. Everyone turned, but for that first moment, nobody did anything. I think they expected him to jump right up again and say, gotcha, knowing he liked to play the fool. When it dawned on them that he'd really gone down, the adults first start scrambling around. His sister, my Aunt Rose, making a beeline for the phone. My first instinct, despite everything, was to look to mom. I saw her, arms crossed, watching from behind the island of the open plan kitchen. There wasn't a lick of emotion on her face. Dad had suffered a heart attack. He died on his way to the hospital, leaving me and my little sister with mom. In that brief moment, me and my sis had not lost only our provider, but our shield. I thought it was my fault. I thought that when I'd snuffed out the candles, I'd somehow cursed him by accident. The seeds of guilt had been planted, and every time afterward that my mom said, This is your fault. It only made me more certain that I'd really done wrong. After the funeral, you'd scarcely have known that she'd lost a husband. The biggest change to her was that our family's tight budget had been reduced even further. The lack of money, the struggle for it, only made mom testier than ever. To her credit, and as much as I hate to say it, she did do whatever she could to earn a living. A bit of cleaning work here, a bit of bar work there. She could keep the holes plugged at least as quick as they appeared. The one thing she couldn't stop was her temper. Dad had been on the receiving end in life, both for himself and for us, but now that he was gone, there was nobody. If she was ever intending to lose her temper at me or my little sister, it was up to me now to take the consequences. I remember when I was about 12, and my sister would have been about 5. We'd been left alone whilst she was out on a cleaning job. It was late in the evening and we'd had dinner before she left, but it didn't amount to much. A couple hours later, and my sister was grabbing at my arm, crying for something more to eat. I chewed over the idea of breaking mom's rule, don't touch the food. As we both got hungrier though, I decided to give in and go hunting for something we could eat. I wasn't expecting much, but seeing the bare cupboards and bare fridge surprised me nonetheless. I leaned on the counter and wondered what to do. Out of the corner of my eye, I lit up as I saw our pathetic holy grail, the bread box. I pulled the cover up and found two slices of bread in their plastic wrapping. Success! There was a little butter left and some raspberry jelly, so I spread us each a piece and then we just sat on the sofa eating our snack. When mom got home though, a small bag of groceries in tow, there was heck to pay. She opened the fridge and she'd just put away the eggs when she noticed the butter was missing. I was reading a book about Stanley Kubrick, or at least half reading, when she turned to look in the bin. She pulled out a wrapper and asked, what's this? Part of me wanted to give the obvious reply, but I knew better than to rock the boat any more than necessary. I told her that me and my sister were hungry, so I made something to tie us over. My answer didn't cut it for her. She came storming over and started giving the third degree with a nasty look in her eyes, like I was some pervert caught in a devious act. In hindsight, I realized that it was about power. Mom had her rules for a reason. She wanted nothing less than full control. My disobeying her, in her eyes, was a lapse in control. 
When she didn't get the answer she wanted, I was left with another stinging cheek. I had become somewhat numb to her outbursts by this point. Don't get me wrong, it still hurt, and I still felt betrayed, but it had almost become routine. My primary worry was my sister. For the time being, mom hadn't touched her. She had shouted at her, which was bad enough, but she'd never crossed the line any further. Still, the worry that she would never left me. It was always in the back of my mind, keeping me on my toes. Recently, though, I'd almost started to discount the possibility, letting it slip out of mind slightly, but here, I'd accidentally dropped my sister in it. As far as my mom was concerned, she was a co-conspirator. She was guilty. I never regretted anything more than implicating my sister. As soon as she was finished with me, she went into the dining room where my sister was drawing. I only anticipated that at most there would be shouting, and that's what there was. I could hear her giving the same verbal lashing that she'd given me, except that's all I could hear. There were no crying or pleas, just mom's voice getting louder and angrier, bursting out of control. Then I heard a muffled smack. Crying followed. The shouting continued. I heard the smack again and again. My blood ran cold. I was paralyzed, my mind running in a hamster wheel. What was I doing? Why couldn't I move? I can't believe I'm being so weak. I'm meant to protect her. These thoughts just kept spinning in my head on a loop. My sister's cries were getting louder and louder. I needed to move, to do something. No matter how hard I tried though, I couldn't get up. But I couldn't continue to hear the repeated smacks, the cries. Reflexively, I covered my ears with my hands, but it did little to drown out the sound. Again and again, smack, smack, smack. Panic and desperation were swelling within me. Please stop. Stop. The words spluttered out of my mouth almost automatically. Then, for an eerie moment, the shouting, the crying, and the smacking came to an abrupt halt. Silence. I didn't let my guard down, though, as I could feel something hanging in the air. Mom came back into the room with a face like thunder and was about to say something when there was a knock at the door. She brushed herself down and steadied herself welding a smile onto her face before going to open it. It was Mrs. Kowalski from next door, coming over to see if we were all okay. She found her way inside and looked around before I caught her eye, pointing at me and mumbling questions to mom. I felt so embarrassed. As slick as ever though, mom charmed her into peace of mind and she was soon on her way. Mom's skill to enchant people around was unbelievable both for her skill and the contrast of its warmth compared to the real her, the one keeping us locked up at home. It meant that the only time I tried to tell someone about what she was doing to us, it achieved nothing. They refused to believe it of her, put my complaints down to childish exaggeration. The despair and dread I felt following that was in like nothing a child should know, nothing I had known, until now. As much as I feared for my sister, I never anticipated just how it would feel for her to be on the receiving end. Never again. On the following Monday, it was back to school. I stayed late on Mondays. I went to film club after school. A small group of us tucked away in a glorified closet. One that smelt of cigarettes because the older kids used it as a smoking room. Currently, we were working on creating our amateur short films. The beauty of everyday life was the theme. We had to take it in turns because there was only one VHS camcorder to go around. When we'd all finished making our little films, we'd be putting on an exhibition in the school hall. My turn was next. I lugged the big black camera home with me, walking the dimly lit streets on my lonesome, wondering what I'd film as I headed home. When I got back, I slipped in quietly and snuck upstairs with my bulky friend, taking it to my bedroom and setting it down on the bed. For a moment, I sat with it and looked out the window, looking at the night sky. There was a crescent moon. I thought about taking it into town at the weekend, finding some beauty in our ramshackle run-down town. My mind latched onto the word run-down. Dirt. Darkness. Beauty. Then I thought of a book on my table. I got up, went over to it, and picked it up. Edgar Allan Poe. I flipped through it until I found the story I was looking for. The darkness, the guilt, the truth that can't be escaped. At that moment, I knew what I must do. I turned back to look at the camcorder on my bed. The sight of it made a violent storm of anger and resentment swell within me. My heart beat faster and harder the longer I stared at it. 
Yeah, I knew what I must do. I waited until my sister went to bed and my mom went to the bathroom. I hurried down the stairs as quietly as I could, camcorder in hand. I went to the living room and tucked the camcorder between the TV stand and the big leafy plant nearby, doing my darndest to make it as inconspicuous as possible. Then, before she came down, I raced over to the cabinet on the other side and pulled out the special bottle of vodka. I remember Aunt May saying that vodka had no flavor, so it was perfect for slipping into mom's cranberry juice. I put in as much as I could without it looking obvious before screwing the top back on and heading back for the cabinet. I could hear mom coming down the stairs as I gently placed it back on its shelf and closing the door. Then as she entered the room, I jumped down onto the nearest chair and slumped. You treat my furniture with respect, is that clear? This was it. This was the beginning. I shrugged my shoulders at her, my heart racing. She didn't follow up though. Instead, she got cozy on the sofa and took a sip of her juice. I decided that it would be best if she drank the whole lot before I went any further. Dallas and the news finished. She finally took the last sip of her drink. Showtime. Being a kid, I wasn't exactly full of scathing, witty remarks, so I told her, You ought to get a bath because you stink. She laughed. The cutting sound of her laughter incensed me. I got up, grabbed her empty glass, and threw it at the wall. She stopped laughing. Fueled by anger, I dared to turn my head and meet her gaze. For a moment, she looked like a deer in the headlights, but then her face contorted into piercing indignation. I kept looking at her, but it was as if she was sucking the anger out of me and making it her own. Suddenly, I felt vulnerable and exposed. She briskly got out of her chair and came over to me, leaning forward until her face was almost touching mine. What do you think you're doing? She said in a low and menacing tone. I had a split second to decide whether or not to go the whole way, but I thought of my sister and of protecting her. Go to heck, you ugly witch. I'll be honest, I don't remember much after the first hit. All I know is that I woke up on the floor sore and aching. When I stumbled to the bathroom, I found out that I had a black eye too. I looked at the time on my watch, it was 5 a.m. I got cleaned up as discreetly as possible, dressed for school, and then crept down the stairs and grabbed the camcorder. I hung around until school opened and then headed straight for the film club room, took the video out of the camcorder, and put it near the bottom of the pile of tapes in the cupboard where the films were kept. For the rest of the day, I went about as normal and pretended my black eye was the result of a fight with another kid. By the time I got home, I found mom sitting on the edge of the sofa facing me. Her expression was stern, but there was a glint in her eyes. About what happened last night, she started. I don't need to make any explanations for my actions. I am your mother after all, but I will concede that perhaps things went a bit far. What I saw in her eyes, I could hear in her voice. A small part of me wanted to believe that it was a kernel of softness, of regret, of love. For my sister though, I remained determined. I simply nodded and went to my room. I sat on the bed for a while, silent and zen-like. What if she'd just shown some inkling of remorse? There was still time to stop. On balance though, I decided that she didn't have limits, that I couldn't take a chance. It would be three long, arduous weeks before the evening of the exhibition. In that time, I kept a low profile, but stuck close to my sister to make sure she was safe. When that Friday evening arrived, mom had us all make an extra effort. There was going to be a number of parents and local folk turning up, so she was determined to make a good impression. We got in the car, and within 15 minutes, we were bathed in the halogen glow of the school's lights. We headed for the auditorium, and mom started mingling with the other adults whilst I went to fetch my film. Walking the empty halls was an eerie thing. The silence seemed to amplify everything. The lights, the polished floor, and even the dull beige-gray lockers that flanked me. It was a deathly ominous moment. Finally, I arrived at the door of our little club room. I grasped the cold metal handle, took a breath, and gave it a sharp push. I was invited into the darkness by the familiar fading scent of Laramie's, fumbling around for the light switch before flicking it on and walking over to the cupboard. I brushed its chipped top with my hand and gave the whole idea one more consideration. I could still back out. This was my last chance. I'd pay heck for it if I did. 
No, I've started it. I must finish it. I swung open the cupboard and grabbed the videotape from its home. The feel of it stirred something within me, something resembling excitement. Fear? No, it was anticipation. I walked back into the auditorium just as everyone was settling into their seats. Mom smiling and beckoning me. The sight of her smiling at me made me feel sick to my stomach, but I couldn't work out whether it was guilt or repulsion. Either way, I bared it. I sat next to her and listened as Mr. Robards, the art teacher, welcomed us and set out the order of play. First up was Jackie. She went up to the stage to introduce herself and talk a bit about her film before handing it over to be played. Hers was a nature film shot at a wildlife reserve a few miles out of town. All things said, it was actually pretty good. I only wish I could have enjoyed it. Next was Tommy, who filmed himself and his friends doing funny stuff, highlighting the beauty and shared laughter. There was still yet one before me, Lisa. She went onto the stage to do her intro, handed her tape over, and just as she foretold, her video was about finding beauty in grim things. She must have read my mind. She'd picked out on one of the most run-down shopping areas and a decaying mansion, presenting them, in fairness, better than I could have done. In such a tense situation, it seemed absurd to feel a pinch of relief over not having to directly compete with her. After she finished, Mr. Robards called me onto the stage. My heartbeat picked up and my hands were starting to get balmy. Slowly, with my heart in my throat, I got up and walked out towards the stage. Everything felt like a blur, and of all the things I could think of, my first thought was, I'm sorry that this will probably ruin Jackson's turn. I walked up the steps, across the stage, and stood behind the wooden podium, clueless as to what to say. I decided to follow my heart. Hello, my name is Jack. Tonight, I want to share a different kind of beauty that I've discovered. It's the beauty of freedom, of truth, and justice. This was a hard-won appreciation, and one that I want to share with everyone. Thank you for listening. My voice quivered a bit and my heart was beating like a drum, but I'd managed it. Mr. Robards came over and held out his hand, and after a pause, shaking, I managed to give him the tape. I followed him to the side of the stage, my eyes welling up slightly, and stood, watching as he fed the tape into the slot. Smoothly, quickly, it disappeared into the abyss and left my control once and for all. I turned my head to the projector screen as he hit play, and from behind the comfort of the curtain watched. In glorious technicolor, our beige and brown living room appeared on the big screen. In the center was me and mom, capturing the moment right after I told her to go to heck. There, in front of a whole crowd, a crowd of fellow parents, neighbors, and well-wishers, my mother watched with them as her earlier self messed me up bad. The reaction wasn't like in the cheesy movies when everybody gasps in unison. No, it was more like a steadily growing collection of whispers and noises. I had edited the tape to finish right after she left me lying on the floor, making it by far the shortest of the films. After it finished, Mr. Robards looked at me aghast and was about to say something when there was a blood-curdling scream from the audience. It was hers, mother's voice. You rat, she shouted. I peeped around the corner of the curtain and saw her standing in her violet dress with a deranged, hungry expression on her face. It hadn't been remorse after all. She caught sight of me and went to move, but the crowd intervened, and Mr. Robard stepped in front of me. Even as one of the fellow mothers and two men blockaded her, she struggled like a wild animal. Mr. Robards conveyed a message to the women up front through a series of gestures before leading me to an empty classroom. He beckoned me to sit and took a seat opposite me. He said, I'd heard that you got that shiner from being in a fight with another boy. I nodded. He says, but that wasn't true, was it? I shook my head. He says, how long has this been going on? I say, ever since I can remember. He sat back in his chair and looked down. You have a younger sister, don't you? I nodded again, and he said, has she? Tears just burst out of me. Once they started, I couldn't stop them. I just cried and cried. Mr. Robards came over and gave me a hug, the sound of approaching police sirens in the distance. Once they arrived and I'd settled down, a female officer came and sat with me. 
She was very understanding and asked me about life with my mother as sensitively as possible, about the tape and other incidents that I could remember. My mother was arrested. In the meantime, me and my sister were uprooted and moved 200 miles east to live with Aunt Jane, my dad's sister, her husband, and their kid. They lived on a farm just a few short miles from the nearest town, and boy, it was some farm. Lots of trees, a little creek, and green as far as the eye could see. Aunt Jane and Uncle Bill welcomed us almost as warmly as their sheepdog Shep. The house was more rustic than ours, but nicer with it. Homely, it wasn't just the decor either, it was the atmosphere. There was a warm, inviting feel to the place. I put it down to the kindness and love that existed between its inhabitants. It gave a light to the place that, as the cliché goes, makes a house a home. It was some time before the case got to court, and I never saw any of the trial. It had been decided that my testimony wasn't necessary, given the smoking gun evidence that they had. When the verdict reached me, I relaxed for what felt like the first time in my life. Guilty. 15 years. I'd sent my own mother to prison, and you know what? I didn't feel the least bit bad for her. Me and my sister settled into our new home, way of life, and discovered the meaning of happiness and peace of mind. We went to new schools, made new friends, and had new experiences. I worked hard at school, got the best grades I could manage, and then went on to college. Now I've got a job in film industry and continue to work towards my dream of making films someday. My sister decided college wasn't for her and dove into the world of business. It took time, but now she's doing well, running her own boutique. Fortunately for her more than me, the memories of the past seem remote and didn't impinge on her as much as me. As for our mother, I got wind of her being released a couple of years early. She must have given the parole board a sweeping with her charm because I can't see why else they'd want to let someone like that out at all, let alone early. Apparently, she'd slumped into alcoholism, living life night by night, throwing herself at men in seedy bars in order to get a warm bed. A couple more shorter stints in prison punctuated her new life as a lady of leisure, one for drug running and another for assaulting a police officer. Old habits die hard, I guess. A part of me says I should feel bad for her, but I can't find it within me. Perhaps a better man could, but I'm not him. To be brutally honest, there's a slither of joy in my heart. A sense that justice has been served. Karma. Kismet. Whatever you want to call it. That feeling is only galvanized since becoming a parent myself. The joy and boundless love that I felt as soon as I laid eyes on my newborn son, I knew that I could never hurt him. If anything, it only left me more bewildered at how my mother could do it to us. I guess there was just an evil in her heart. I know that my sister still thinks about getting in touch, but I've advised her against it. I told her that it would open a can of worms that ought to stay shut. Time in her young age takes the edge off her memories of her, and she's got a fine heart, but she still lets it take her away at times. She wants to believe that her mother wasn't as bad as all that. I think she trusts my judgment though. She knows I wouldn't be so sure unless I had reasons to be so. And so we've stayed well away from her, leading good and fulfilling lives. That day my father died, I lost the man I loved and respected the most. It was the worst day. In that moment though, I also lost the only reason to stick around. A new possibility to escape was created. It was the best day. Honestly, it's such a disheartening thing to hear about OP's experience and how, at one point, OP mentioned that they tried to admit to somebody what was going on behind closed doors and they weren't even believed because their mom is just such a charismatic person. It's just crazy that OP had to feel obligated to go all the way to showing a graphic video in front of everybody at a film debut to finally get the truth out there. Considering everything the mom did and what ended up happening to the mom after the truth was out there, do you feel like justice was truly served? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Is revenge against an awful ex? I never thought I would want to share this story again, but my best friend and I have been reminiscing about our past mistakes lately, and this was one of the things we laughed loudest over. It was the worst thing to happen, and I was really heartbroken at the time. But it's now been over 10 years since it happened, and I think I'm ready to finally talk about it. When I was in my early 20s, I think 24 or thereabout, I met this guy, let's call him D. 
because although he had a really big you know what, he turned out to be a huge D-bag. Anyway, D and I met on a holiday cruise that my friends and I go to every year as part of our little way to stay reunited since leaving college. It was the peak of summer and the cruise was in Italy so I was always in bikinis and tiny clothes. His father owned the boat and the guest house that my friends and I were staying in, so we got really cozy really fast. I discovered that his grandparents were filthy rich, which made him rich by default. He was the hottest man I'd laid my eyes on, with a tan, always shirtless body, straight white teeth, and the perfect smile. My friends and I ogled him all the time, as did some other fields, but he took interest in me first, which made me very happy. Although I wasn't ugly, I also wasn't exactly the most good-looking girl in my friend group, so it came to me as a surprise. I had dated a lot, but D was the sweetest person by far. He said all the right things, took me on the most romantic dates, and to visit all the places that tourists missed out on. And he spent a lot of money on me. I was a gal from a low-slash-average income home, and I usually dated people from the same financial circle, so most of our dates were pretty low income. But this man had more money than he or his family knew what to do with. So he bought anything I wanted as soon as I indicated any sort of interest in it. It was a little strange at first, as I was used to doing things myself, but the more I complained, the more he showered me in gifts. He did it until I finally shut up and agreed to be spoiled by him. I thoroughly enjoyed myself, and by the end of summer, we were already saying I love yous, and I even met with his parents for dinner a few nights. They loved me, and his mother even gave me a gorgeous necklace that I still have to this day. It felt like we were meant to be, and I was so sure that I'd found the one. His money was only an added advantage to the fact that he was sweet, smart, and incredibly well-mannered. Unfortunately, summer was over before I knew it, and I had to go back to my real life in the US. I was so devastated because I wanted our summer relationship to last forever, and I wasn't ready to leave him. On my last night in Italy, he took me out for a candlelit dinner and we went on a romantic walk along a bridge. At the end of things, he gave me a promise ring. It was the sweetest thing and I felt like I was being proposed to. Somehow we talked about making it work despite the distance and I was beyond thrilled. I wasn't ready to end things with him yet. The entire time that we dated virtually, it was filled with phone calls, online you know what, and he wired me money and surprised me with gifts pretty randomly. I had the good sense to save most of the money, thank God. Nearly three months into our relationship, I got a call from D that he was on his way to the USA to see me. Naturally, I was elated, and I found him a really good hotel to stay in for the two weeks that he would be around. I was so on edge that all my friends and coworkers noticed that I was expecting something. My best friend and I had worked at an animal shelter together at the time, and she constantly asked me why I was so happy. I'd been keeping my long distance relationship under wraps from everyone and I wasn't ready to tell her, so I lied and said that I was just in a much better mood lately. I was counting down the days on my calendar with fervent anticipation, hoping and praying that nothing would happen to disrupt my boyfriend and I's plans. I don't know why, but for some reason, I felt like I needed to keep him a secret from everyone. I spoke in hushed tones, cooped up in one corner of my room whenever I spoke to him. Eventually, my super handsome, super rich boyfriend made his way to my hometown, and I took a few days off of work just to stay with him. All we did at the hotel was eat, have lots of fun, and sleep in. The perfect little mini staycation. We also had a lot of conversations about our future separately, but I could see him in mine. He studied law at a prestigious Italian university, and planned to get a master's degree before he would begin practicing. I studied to be a veterinary doctor at the local community college, but I also did have plans to further my education. It felt like we aligned in all of the right ways. We talked about children, and it turned out he wanted as many children as I did. And it all seemed so perfect, him and I, that I started to dream of a future together, marriage and all. Trouble in paradise began when Dee decided that he wanted to meet my family. A little backstory on my family. I'm an only child, and my parents had me pretty young. My dad became a trucker to support, and he'd been doing the job for a good chunk of years. Mom learned to cut hair and had been doing the neighborhood's hair for years while taking care of me. It was a pretty good family dynamic, and I loved and adored my parents, as they did me. But there was one major problem. 
My mother was a very slim woman, yet well endowed, and she took advantage of it by wearing as little as she could manage. I want you to take a moment to imagine a 47-year-old woman wearing hoochie shorts that her butt hung out of, and a teeny tiny crop top. That was my mother. My dad loved it when she dressed like that because it supposedly made him feel young, but it embarrassed me immensely right from my school days. She never paid any attention to me, and sometimes she called me jealous. I tried to talk him out of it, telling him that my family was strict, my mother hated men, and my father had a gun. I felt like the more I tried to dissuade him, the more he was determined that he could make my parents love him. In the end, I just came clean that I was not exactly ready for him to meet my parents, and he blew up on me. He talked about how I'd met his parents before we even became an item. I tried to explain that we were not from the same kind of background, but he wasn't very understanding and walked out on me. We made up eventually, but he did not stop insisting on meeting my family. Caught up in a post-reunion bliss, I agreed to set a date with my parents within the rest of the week that he would be around. I was a bundle of nerves as I sat my parents down to speak to them about setting the date. My father was pretty jolly, but my mother made a complete fuss, even refusing to eat dinner. I spent the rest of the night convincing her that I was still her little baby girl. For context, I was 24 years old at the time and living about two hours away from them. My father also had to promise her a new bag so that she would stop whining, but eventually she did. Fast forward to the night of the date. I had on a gorgeous new dress that he'd gotten me, a new pair of high heels, and the necklace his mother had gifted me. He wore a suit and picked me up in a rented limo, and I felt like prom all over again. We arrived at my house and D dove right in, showering my parents in compliments, an expensive bottle of wine, and a bracelet for my mother. As usual, mother was dressed in one of her hoochie dresses, and I noticed that she paid a lot of attention to him. A stark contrast to the screaming and crying mother that I'd spoken to about him barely a week before. I didn't mind it because I was just happy that my family and my boyfriend were getting along well. So well, in fact, that my mother insisted that he slept over at our place for the night. The next day, I woke up to my father back to work and my mother cooking my boyfriend breakfast in an almost see-through negligee. I ignored it because that was who she was. I should have realized that something was wrong when my lovely boyfriend decided on a whim to get a place permanently in the US, and even more when my mother offered him the guest room to sleep in until he was able to get his own place. But I was honestly just happy that our relationship wasn't going to be long distance anymore. Over the next couple of weeks, we lost a few co-workers at the vets and I had to pick up a few extra shifts at work. I assumed that it would also give D time to figure out his moving situation although it started to feel like we hardly spoke or saw each other anymore. I missed them a lot and decided to drop by my family's home one day, but it seemed eerily empty, even though the doors weren't locked. I walked into the house and heard a familiar sort of grunting from my parents' bedroom. My initial thought was it was the parents just trying to spice things up because they did that a lot when I was in high school, and I walked in on them just about any and everywhere. But then... The unmistakable Italian accent that my supposed boyfriend had echoed through the hallway and into my ears, shocking me. Blindly angry, I stormed in and found my mother on top of D, going at it so earnestly like she'd found some sort of magic that she couldn't get enough of. I was livid with anger and I screamed bloody murder, watching them as they scrambled off of each other, struggling to cover themselves up. It took so many weeks of begging, a ton of gifts and money from both guilty parties, and numerous promises for me to begin talking to my mother and Dee again. I promised to keep their secret safe from my dad, if they only swore to stay away from each other. If he guessed that they didn't, you would be very correct. I don't know what it is that he saw in my mother, or why my mother decided to treat my father terribly, but I knew that I couldn't let it slide. I continued to act oblivious to their continuous affair while leaving a small camcorder hidden inside an empty cupboard that faced the bed that they committed their atrocities on. When they weren't around, I would sneak in, change the batteries, and put the camera back. By the day of my parents' 25th marriage anniversary, I had compiled an entire short film, and I made sure to drink a lot too. Just after my congratulatory speech to my parents, I handed it to the DJ in the corner and took my seat. 
Grinning with a satisfaction as the wonton sounds of my brother and boyfriend hooking up fill the entire room. I walked away from the venue teary-eyed, but feeling very accomplished by what I chose to do. It took quite the toll on me mentally, but with time I was able to move away from it and get into another relationship and even get married. My parents' relationship was never the same. Although they never got a divorce, my father didn't sleep in the same bed as my mother ever again. My mother and I also don't speak to each other anymore, but I don't regret a thing. I think that she deserved what she got completely. Do you guys think it's just overall creepy for OP to go and put the camcorder in the room and record it? Or considering how heartbreaking it is, do you not really blame them for doing that and exposing them the way they did? Is this just too far? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is struggling with both my food and my ex. As a child, I always loved shiny things. I enjoyed being praised and thanked and just noticed for every little thing I did, whether it was worthy of attention or not. Being the only girl and the last child among four kids made sure that I got whatever it was that I wanted. My parents had my brothers when they were in their 20s, and then I was a happy little mistake that came along when they turned 40. So they all treated me like the little princess that I was and gave me absolutely everything I asked for. As a kid, one of the other things I really, really loved was food. I was a rabid little thing, always looking for the next thing to eat. And nobody had it in their hearts to stop me from doing what I wanted. Instead, they would back and reward me with more snacks and candy. I mean, who could refuse me, an oversized and very adorable child, from doing what I wanted? It was a plus that I was pretty good most of the time and rarely gave any trouble, except of course when I was hungry and left unattended near the kitchen. Not that I intend to blame anyone, but now that I think back, maybe somebody should have supervised my eating when I started to get older. I understand that everybody was already pretty grown up, and the easiest way to stop me from getting in their way was to let me eat until I was in a food coma, but still there should have been some sort of rule concerning my eating. Seeing as I was a round ball of human that only kept getting rounder. I couldn't blame them though, my parents were first generation Russian immigrants. And as a Russian, being very chubby was the utmost sign of a very healthy child. I went through preschool and elementary school pretty normally, as a lot of my classmates at that time were just as chubby as me with baby fat, so I didn't stand out too much from everyone else. By the time I was transitioning into middle school, Puberty had started for most kids my age, and they were growing into their taller, prettier, and more gangly selves. There were many emotions flying about, and a lot of friendship groups had also started to turn more permanent. But I found myself alone more often. Being younger than most of my mates by two years made me a little isolated, and since puberty hadn't hit for me, I didn't have a lot in common with my classmates anymore. It wouldn't have bothered me too much if my brothers were still loving and doting over me, but they were all done with college and had started to move on to their personal lives, leaving me alone with my pretty old and extremely busy parents. My oldest brother was already married, the brother right behind him, although he still lived at home, worked a lot and was soon to be married, while the brother that was directly older than me just moved to New York to pursue a career. I was lonely at home, and my social life was also in shambles, pretty much non-existent. It seemed like there was just one thing that could make me feel better, which was food. With barely anyone around to cook for me, I dug out my parents' cookbooks and began to learn to cook for myself, and by age 13, I was the one who made dinner for myself and my parents. At that age, I was already a freshman in high school, and I was also a loner. All of my friends were teachers who were pretty impressed by my academic record, but they were also adults with lives and responsibilities. Whatever relationships we had ended right after school, so it barely solved my loneliness issue. With no friends my age and no invites to any social activities outside school, I had no option but to get very good at my studies. I thought it would help me to make some friends if I joined clubs and engaged in school activities once in a while, but it didn't work. I was just the fat girl who showed off so much that she became the teacher's pet. The sadder I was, the more I turned to food, and by the time I was a junior in high school, I was a size 14. My parents only saw their beautiful and smart little girl, and no matter how busy they got, they never failed to let me know that. 
but I was too caught up in my own little head that I refused to acknowledge it or believe anything that they said. Even my brothers who lived far away had started to notice that I was no longer the happy little girl they knew. They called me a lot and had me visit during weekends and short holidays, but it wasn't enough to make me feel less depressed. With all my free time, I had the opportunity to volunteer at different clubs in school. My favorite was the journalism club because I had to use my brains more than any other body, which worked perfectly for me. Once I started to get properly acquainted, I found that I made friends a little easier. Most of the kids there were just as shy as me and soon we found that we had a lot in common. Before long, I went from having no friends to having four people that could relate to my pains and didn't make me feel like my body was a hindrance to them. They carried me along and I found myself being happy in their presence. One of them in particular was the boy that would later break my heart into a million tiny pieces. My ex. He was a charming boy with nice blonde hair, a pretty fit body, and a nice sense of style. I fell really quick. But I couldn't let it show because he was so much cooler, played soccer, and just so much more popular than me. I didn't think of it as anything when he asked me to hang out alone in the bleachers or when he brought me food. I mean, he was the president of the club, and maybe he did the same thing for others. I hid my feelings until he asked me to come to a soccer game, had a jersey with his name printed on the back personalized for me, and then kissed me after his team won the game. If that didn't scream, we're officially dating, then I don't know what else could. I was so smitten with my new relationship, but even more, I was obsessed with the new friends that I had. So obsessed that I didn't notice that they seemed fake and fickle despite how obvious it was. They always smiled at me, had their cameras out to film me, and laughed extra hard when I said or did anything. I thought it to be regular friend things. After all, I'd never had friends before. So I adjusted. I started to do whatever my ex wanted, sending risque photos despite being really self-conscious about myself, waking up super early to go jogging, and even eating a few times less than I usually did. He praised me for losing weight and that felt good, so I attached myself to it, completely disconnecting myself from my family. By senior year, I'd been with my ex for 11 months, dropped to a size 10, developed bulimia and a terrible binge eating habit and even more severe self-esteem issues. On prom night, my ex-boyfriend and his friends gathered on stage and killed a huge part of me with their behaviors. They had compiled all the videos they had taken of me over the past couple of months, all the intimate pictures I'd sent to him, and even my childhood pictures from my parents' Facebook and played it for the entire school to see. After which he called me every insulting name imaginable and told me how terrible it had been prank dating me. He had a sneer on his face that was ingrained in my head for a while and I was horrified. I couldn't believe my luck and I walked all the way home teary eyed but numb. My parents found out about it but I begged them to let it go. High school was already over and there was no need to make a fuss over something that couldn't be changed. Right after my graduation, I went to New York for uni, and I was set to stay with my older brother. He was pretty loaded by that time, so life was good for me. He put me up for therapy, and I started working out, but for myself this time, not just to lose weight. I studied journalism, and my brother was a big shot in the New York tech space, so getting a job wasn't hard at all. Along the line, I met a man who said he was a model scout, and told me I would make a lovely model. Because of my tainted body image, I turned him down politely. We still spoke for a while before he admitted to liking me and asking me out on a date. Now, it had been a little over four years since I'd graduated high school, but I still had dating PTSD. I was hesitant, but the man was unrelenting and very sweet. He was also rich and showered me with gifts and affection until I fell for him as well. It was so different from my initial relationship and I was really happy. There was an age gap of about 24 years, so he was nearly in his 50s, but he was a silver fox with a lot of hair and a very fit body, so he looked a little younger. I enjoyed my time with him, and we had already begun to say I love you to each other by the third month of dating. Despite his age, my family also thought him to be lovely, so we had their approval. I knew that he had an adult son who lived with his ex-wife, 
and had been divorced since his son was three, he had never remarried since. One weekend, we were set to go to his place in the Hamptons, but the weather was so bad that we decided to make it a staycation at his loft in New York. It was the first time I was at his place for longer than just staying the night, but I loved it. Bubble baths, hanging out, and he even cooked for me. We also shared some stories and I told him about my high school experience. He was loving, understanding, and apologized on behalf of the jerk, promising me that he would never do something like that. The next morning, he proposed to me, telling me that it was the reason we were to go to the Hamptons, but the weather ruined his plans. I was so happy that I started to cry, but I said yes, and we informed my family. I started to stay at his house more often, and one day, while I was snooping around, I found a picture of a face that made a lot of buried emotions resurface. I asked my fiancé, and he said that the person in the photo was his son. My ex was my fiancé's son. It hit me like a ton of bricks, because how could such a perfect man birth such a spawn of Satan? I was sad for a while, but then I jumped at the opportunity of revenge to make my ex pay. I started to talk about planning our wedding, and my fiancé was more than happy to get right into it with me. There was no elaborate engagement party or anything because we jumped straight to the rehearsal dinner when our families would meet for the first time. It was the most entertaining night of my life, watching my ex trying to figure out if he'd just been seeing things, or if I really was the one. He ogled at me the entire night, and when he could spare a second, he pulled me aside to demand that I stop seeing his father immediately. I let him rant until he was red in the face before putting him in his place. I wasn't upset or anything, just amused at the fact that he had the audacity to even speak to me after all that he and his friends put me through in high school. My fiancé confronted me after the dinner, and I let him know that his son was the jerk who broke my heart and ruined my reputation. He was understanding, very livid, and even agreed with me to help in my plan for revenge. We had the wedding at my fiancé's house in the Hamptons, a lovely and elegant wedding where my brother's girlfriend was my maid of honor and my ex was his father's best man. My family knew our story and it was hilarious to watch them scowl at my ex, making him visibly uncomfortable all through his father's wedding. Besides that, it went very well, and we had our honeymoon in Bali for three entire months. When we got back, we got news that my ex's mother had kicked him out due to some bad behavior, and he was pretty down on his luck. His father agreed to house him for six months while he tried to pick himself back up. I could tell that he was very uncomfortable seeing his father and I together, but he had to get used to it because I was here to stay. I fell pregnant barely six months into our marriage and my now husband was so excited that he forbade me from doing a lot of things until the baby was born. Because he still had to work, he made sure that my ex was at my beck and call, letting him know that it was either that or he would have to leave the house and find himself somewhere else to stay by. Nothing feels sweeter than revenge, especially if it's the kind of revenge where you can see the person's face. I know that my ex will feel weird for as long as he lives, and he also won't be able to talk about our situation to anyone, because how will he explain to the rest of the world that his father got married to his ex-girlfriend, who he treated like absolute crap in high school? It's a bit of a weird situation to be in, but one that is well deserved. Honestly, I think the main thing that impresses me here is OP, despite how weird that situation is, never really seemed too bothered by the realization. Like, I feel like for a lot of people, finding this out would make them just full-on drop that relationship. For OP, though, it was the total opposite. It was like, let's turn this thing up to 11, let's go turbo. I just hope it reminds the son how much of a jerk they were back then, and every time they gotta help out OP, they think back to how much of a jerk they were, and they gotta think about where their life ended up. I got revenge on my cheating boyfriend. This actually happened last year, but it still makes me wonder what I was actually thinking, and also laugh out loud because the way things turned out was just too wild to be true. But it did happen, and I'm so happy I got to get my revenge on the cheating, lying scum. 
I met this guy, let's call him F, when I was interning at a digital marketing company and he was like the floor manager of this fast food restaurant I used to have my lunch break at. I took an instant liking to him the very first time I saw him because he'd come out to address some drama involving a very nasty Karen and a very fed up waiter. The way he put the situation out was impressive, and call me stupid, but I found that so attractive, especially when he smiled at me as he was heading back to his office, which was pretty much a shoebox space behind the order counter. After that particular day, it almost seemed like he knew exactly when I was coming to have lunch, and he found a reason to come say hi to me and my coworkers, two other girls and a guy. My coworkers were always telling me that he liked me pretty much from the beginning. But I wasn't convinced because he seemed to act that way with everyone who came into the restaurant. He was the standard nice guy, you know? The type that remembers things about regulars, gives kids a little meal toy, even though there's nothing mentioning that on the menu, and hands out leftovers to the homeless people on the street corner. But at the same time, he was a huge flirt, and he didn't try to hide it. I guess his niceness cancelled that out and everyone just chalked his flirty character up to him being overly nice so I didn't think too much of it when he started flirting with me. It started with the wrong order, or at least I thought it was when my order for tacos became a plate of pasta. But it wasn't until I stepped up to the counter to complain that I realized F was the one waiting to attend to me, and he had apparently switched my order so I could approach the counter. We had a quick laugh, he gave me my actual plate, and he asked for my name. I got back to my table where my lunch buddies were ooing and aahing and... I didn't give much thought to the whole thing. Then it became like a routine thing. We'd come in for lunch, he'd call my name from across the room and stop by to say hi. He eventually learned the names of all of my lunch buddies and rearranged his schedule to take his lunch break with us. But I still didn't think it was anything special. Call me dumb, but I honestly think that was my angel trying to help me avoid a messy situation. But I didn't realize it until much, much, much later. After a month of hanging out during lunch, I was celebrating graduating from college and getting promoted to a junior level at work. My lunch buddies had invited F over to the bar we were meeting up at without telling me. I was shocked when he stepped in, but it was a pleasant surprise because after happy hour, tons of shots and tone-deaf singing from my friends and co-workers, he and I headed to the bar to order a last round for everyone, and while we waited for the bartender to serve us, He leaned over to tell me congratulations. I turned to respond and he kissed me on my cheek and gave me a small gift bag I hadn't noticed him carrying. There was no further argument at that point. His intentions were clear as day and he was the sweetest person ever with no flaws in sight, which should have been a blinding red flag, but I wasn't thinking about that. Long story short, We hooked up that night and I was pretty sure I was halfway in love with him already because of how attentive he was and all. One thing that kept hitting the side of my head though was the fact that he didn't bother to use protection and never did for the most part of our relationship. He asked if I was on the pill and then went straight for the home run, but in the moment, I was interpreting this whole thing as him making sure I was fine first. A few weeks later, we were officially in a relationship and his flirting in the restaurant at least during the hour I was coming in, came to a very obvious end. And because, of course, my boyfriend is the floor manager, I was definitely getting special treatment. My lunch buddies and I never had to stress about finding a table during lunch hours, and on days that work was particularly stressful, he'd step out with me and sometimes we'd walk, sometimes we'd end up in his car. Listen, you couldn't rain on my parade in the least because I was doing well at work, had my own place with one of my closest friends, and a boyfriend who made women do a double look when he walked by. You can't blame me for not noticing that he was also paying attention and reciprocating their glances. I was on cloud nine, and I was definitely in love with him two months into the relationship. And, like the universe was trying to help me again... Things started getting twisted up the very next day after we said I love yous. I had a stinging pain down there and I knew I was being safe with like toilet hygiene, but it didn't immediately occur to me that I wasn't being safe when it came to hooking up. I ended up in the ER and after some testing, I was told I had an STI. And you best believe that I argued it out with them because as far as I knew, I had a loyal boyfriend. And I was loyal to him too, so I was convinced that diagnosis was a mix-up. 
And when the symptoms happened several times within a month after the first incident, I thought it was a mix-up again. And then again when it happened by the time we were four months into the relationship. By that time though, I was coming down from the honeymoon high of the relationship, and I wasn't willing to let things slide. He was basically living in my apartment at this point, and I was getting a full blast of his many, many flaws. He would order stuff online, and conveniently not be home when it gets delivered so that I'll have to pay, and then whenever I asked him to pay it back, he'd tell me he's cash strapped or his ATM would be missing. I couldn't stand it, but it wasn't enough ground for a huge fight, yet. One day, he called me while I was at work and he was having his day off at home. I was super excited because I thought he was calling to plan a night out or something, but he was sounding excited on the phone because his close cousin was around and he wanted to introduce us. Now, his family lives several states away from the city we're both in, so I knew that the chances of meeting them would be very little, at least until we got to a certain milestone in our relationship. So excited was really an understatement when it comes to how I was feeling about getting to meet his cousin. When I got home that night, he told me she had wanted to leave like an hour earlier, but she was waiting to meet me. And when I saw her, the first thing that struck me was how beautiful she was. We exchanged greetings, she promised to visit later, and I thought nothing of the whole meeting because I was just excited that I was moving to a new stage of my relationship with F. For about two months after this, as our relationship hit the six month mark, his cousin would come around, usually when I'm not home, and leave within minutes or an hour of my return. F explained that it wasn't because she didn't like me, she just worked long hours at night and usually came out to hang with him on his days off because they couldn't find time otherwise, and they were each other's only family in the city. That was a truckload of lies and I ate it all up, and I found out in the most cliche way ever. One day I was at work and I started feeling really sick, so my team lead sent me home to get some rest. While waiting for my Uber on the sidewalk, a car splashed rainwater on me, and I think my resolve was already pretty weak from feeling ill and the strain that I was starting to feel in the relationship, so by the time I got in the Uber, I was crying. I noticed the driver trying to catch my eyes and check in on me, but I didn't even have the strength to even lift my head. When I got home, I texted F and went straight to bed, splashed clothes and all. Hours later, I woke up and noticed that he'd left my message on red and didn't respond or call. I soaked in a warm bath, got my clothes out of the laundry basket, and piled them in the washing machine. While I was watching them wash and ordering chicken noodle soup, I noticed a pile of F's clothes that seemed to permanently live near the washing machine. Being the doting girlfriend that I was, despite being sick, I decided to sort the clothes and figure out if they need washing or folding. As soon as I grabbed the first piece, I felt something in the shirt pocket and brought it out. It was a tiny android phone. What was he doing with an android when he just borrowed money from me to get an iPhone 12? Was the phone his? Or did he find it at work and decided to keep it in case the owner came looking? I was getting ready to dismiss the whole phone situation, but then it vibrated. A quick look at the screen showed an incoming text from someone saved as SOS, and it said, When's your next day off? I miss you already. Text me when you get this. My heart was doing cardwheels to explain the possibility of it not being his phone, but my mind was hard set on the fact that I'd gotten myself in a relationship with a liar and a cheat, but I needed concrete proof, so I decided to wait before making a scene or taking any action. Later that week, he mentioned that he was having a day off soon and would like us to hang out. So I put on an excited smile and told him we could go out later that night since it was a Friday. And then I slyly asked if his cousin was coming around. He said, if you want to hang out with her, we could all go to a bar when you get back from work. I nodded along and when his day off rolled around, I left the house like I usually did for work. But instead of driving to work, I decided to park a few buildings away from our apartment and watch his day unfold. At about 12 p.m., he came downstairs to pick up a pizza order, and then again an hour later for a Chinese food delivery, which instantly set off my alarms, because he hated Chinese food, or at least that's what he always told me. By 2 p.m., I saw his cousin pull up to the building, and he was outside to meet her in record time. Immediately, 
I remembered how many times he'd claimed he was doing the dishes or some other silliness whenever I told him to come help with groceries that I'd bought with my own money. But that's aside. They went inside and I waited for an hour, enough time for them to get settled before driving back and entering the building. I tried the apartment door, but it was locked and I could hear music coming from inside. I decided to try my key and F must have removed the key at the other end because I was able to unlock the door and enter the apartment. They weren't in the living room, but the box of pizza and half-finished chicken chow mein were on the table. I saw the Android phone on the table as well and that answered that question. I took a picture of the table and stepped back out of the apartment to arrive later. When I got back in, like I was just coming from work, the table was clear and only held bottles of beer and chips. What I would typically see after their hangouts. I didn't say anything, but I told them I couldn't go out because I was tired, and that excuse covered my reason for not wanting to hook up with F that night. Meanwhile, the real reason was I could barely stand to sleep in the bed that I knew they'd done stuff in, much more sleep with him hours later. I kept up the act for two weeks, and I kept tabs and gathered pictures of the texts I could find. He had two other babes he was messing around with, and I kept silent, though my anger had hit a tipping point already. Eventually, he had a day off, and I did the same stakeout, but this time, instead of stopping in the living room, I decided to burst open the bedroom door. But before I did that, I wanted to be able to listen to him try to beg his way out of the situation with his expert charm without feeling the urge to give in. So while they were busy in the bedroom I'd paid for and decorated, I unplugged his PS5 from the stand in the living room and dropped it from our second floor window to the pavement below. The crash was loud, but the music playing was louder, so I wasn't shocked that it didn't interrupt them. Then I took the game pads, turned on the warm water setting in the kitchen sink, and left them for a soak. I was barely halfway done with my revenge. I had printed out the screenshots of his Android phone texts and I stuck some of them to our apartment door before taking his car key and heading downstairs to do more damage. I had a small bag of supplies with me, and while I'll admit that I felt a bit manic about doing all these, I was past the point of caring, and I just wanted him to have to deal with all the mess while I healed from the broken heart he gave me. I took out a big bottle of liquid glue from my bag of supplies and sprayed it on his car seats, trunk, and handles before spraying the entire vehicle with pink glitter. Then I took the leftover text printouts and glued them to his windscreen and windows. I took a step back, admired my work, and took a picture from my friendship group chat where I had been updating them about the situation once I found out F was cheating. I went back upstairs and barged in on them in the bedroom movie style. She was scrambling to get covered and he was staring at me wide-eyed so to creep him out further, I told him, I'll leave you two to it, but by tomorrow I expect you to be out of this apartment and out of my life. And he did exactly as I'd said. I never saw him again. At some point, I expected him to sue for damages, but... I guess he figured that it wasn't worth the stress of recounting all the errors he had committed. My friends and I stopped going to the restaurant where he works, and I got another job out of town. I saw his cousin last night at a birthday party for my teammate at work. I could see the fear in her eyes when she recognized me, knowing I could ruin her relationship by spilling about her past to her new boyfriend, one of my coworkers. But I think I'll hold on to this leverage for now. Who knows when it might come in handy. Do you guys blame OP if they tried to tank a good situation that was going on for this girl who played the role of the cousin? Like let's say OP catches wind somehow of this cousin getting a nice cushy job. Would you blame OP if they gave the employers the information they knew and tried to kind of sabotage them? Is that just unhealthy going too far? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. And our final story of the day is my team lead denied my promotion. So I told his wife, whatever opinions you think you'll have about me from reading the title, just chuck them out the window. Not only do I know that I'm not a hero or a victim in this situation, I also know that I take responsibility for how the situation got as bad as it was. And that I could have handled the ending of things a lot better, but it is what it is. The whole thing is a mess, and I wrote it down for internet strangers to read months ago, but I just got the will to post it. The week after I started working at this organization, I started sleeping with my coworker. 
It was unplanned, and I didn't realize that my Friday night one night stand was going to be attending a stand up meeting with me on Monday. But our vibes were cool, and I indulged so much that night that I was still buzzing from the excitement when I resumed work on Monday. Apparently he'd been away on sick leave the week before, while I was onboarding, and because he was feeling better on that Friday morning, he had taken his friends up on their club offer, and the rest was history. But we chose to revisit it, multiple times. After the awkward, are you, do you remember, exchange, we laughed it off exchanged numbers and the next weekend we decided to hang out in a very loaded context we slept together again and continued to do so for three months he got a promotion became my team leader and i told him i felt the dynamics of our situation had changed but he didn't want to let it go so we decided to work around it and he assigned an assistant team leader so that i wouldn't be reporting directly to him and that was good enough for me So we continued to sleep together for another seven months. Then he got a girlfriend. I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say that I didn't date other people while he and I were messing around, but I can boldly say that I didn't truly consider any of them for relationship prospects. As a software engineer and technical writer, work is my first and most vital priority, and he was fulfilling my other needs. I didn't have a lot lacking in between. So I never understood why or how he entered a relationship, and I never got a valid explanation, despite the fact that he married her a year after they started dating. After all, it didn't change things between us, at least that's what he said, or maybe it's what I wanted him to do. Whoever was the driving factor aside, we mutually agreed to continue sleeping together, and I'm not going to lie, I loved it. I was super confident and reassured of his plans concerning me, earth-shatteringly good hooking up and nothing more. But then he switched up the trend of things between us and that's when I think I began to lose touch of the limits and boundaries that apply to the downright horrible thing we were doing. Months after he started dating his wife and longer before he decided to propose to her, he told me he needed to talk to me after we had spent the night together. I thought he was finally deciding to do what was right for his relationship with his partner, but I was way off. He wanted us to spend a day together without it ending in a twirl in the sheets. In full disclosure, I can readily admit that I felt my heartstrings pull when he suggested this. It's hard to date when you're in love with your work, and it seemed like someone who understood me in a professional and personal way was taking an emotional interest in me. Did I forget that he was with a partner and I was basically helping him cheat? No, not in the least. But I was too detached from my emotional core to even consider an alternative to what was going on between us. In my mind, what we were doing wasn't having a direct effect on his girlfriend because he had a very different relationship with her than he did with me. I understand that this sounds unbelievably stupid, but I was too caught up in the feelings and emotions I was experiencing. So I was consciously ignoring the obvious. I took him up on his invitation and we went on what can only be referred to as a date. We had a picnic, he packed and brought everything, and then saw a movie, spent an hour on Ferris rides, and he cooked me dinner. When I was leaving for the night, he mentioned that his girlfriend was getting back from an out-of-state event the following weekend, so I was welcome to spend the night during the week. I didn't take him on that offer because it felt too much like being a placeholder, but I saw him every night that week at my own place. To cut the messy tale short, we were a good thing for only both of us and toxic to those around us, but one thing that never got affected directly or indirectly was our work. He kept things civil, and I respected his authority as his assistant acted as the perfect buffer to help us avoid any tempting situations or incidents that can be taken out of context. But then that all started to change after he proposed to his girlfriend. According to him, He only proposed to her to put himself in a prime position for a salary review. A plus for his performance review if HR understands that he's a breadwinner and that nothing between us had to change. I was emotionally dense enough to be okay with this and we continued like that for a while. But once again, he started to act funny. He would call for long hours and rant about how she was a bad partner for not understanding him like I did and how he wished he'd seen the potential for a long-term relationship back when we met at the club and had the one-night stand that turned into a one-year stand. 
these calls were persistent and the content was consistent, but I was beginning to realize that he was using me as a crutch. And sadly at the time, I didn't mind. I could answer a few calls, listen without attachment, and still enjoy his company and our physical attraction. But like most things with this person, it soon hit a startling turn. Our company was splitting the department into two and needed two team leads to handle both aspects of specialization. A fact that everyone but this person was eager about. What this split meant was that someone would lobby for the position of the second team lead and have to work with him. I wasn't too eager about working so closely with him considering our past and then ongoing history, but I was more excited about the prospects for my career, so I knew I was going to do my all to get it. And I thought that this person who'd seen me inside, outside, and sideways on weekends would be able to vouch for me because his recommendation could seal the deal. So I told him about my plans, foolishly, and gushed to him about how I needed his push to get me over the fence. And he was the exact picture of encouragement. So much so that I was beginning to consider the possibility of him finding the courage to end things with her and explore a possibility with me. But things went so far left from that. First were the random queries from the boss's office at HQ. They were asking about my interactions and relationships with male co-workers, especially people like my team lead. I was so confused, but I answered them honestly, and that only led to even more questions that seemed vague on the outside, but scary leading with further inspection. It was obvious that they were conducting an investigation on me, but the reason was unknown. Only for a while. I was still fielding the unending barrage of questions and trying to figure out the chain of events leading to the obvious investigation when one question threw me completely off and landed me right in the pool of truth. Have you ever or currently harbor thoughts of exploring a sexual relationship with this person? And I knew my journey to getting a promotion I was more than deserving of was over before it truly began. That question was a direct probe into my professional capacity on the grounds of potential harassment. If I answered yes, I'd be implicating myself. If I answered no, it would have been an endless string of questioning that would have ended in a polygraph test. And at that point, my blood wasn't curling blue with hatred when I thought of him, so I knew a polygraph test would be dangerous. After two months of investigation, alongside the interviews I was doing for the position, HR called me to their office and showed me a printed piece of paper that basically contained an email I'd allegedly sent to this guy saying that I wanted to do things to him and I couldn't wait until he'd be rid of the witch. That was just ridiculous because we never exchanged emails that were unprofessional and that was most certainly a setup from the team lead. But in order to get them to listen, I would have to tell them the truth about our relationship and I couldn't deal with all that drama. So I simply gave them access to my email for further investigation and waited for their paperwork or punishment or whatever. And a week after this fake email emerged, they were able to prove that I didn't send it. But I'd been mixed up in so much drama that they had to remove my application for the promotion. At this point, I knew there wasn't a lot I could do about the whole situation, so I just took it in stride. A week after my promotion was rejected, We finally met in the parking lot and his reasoning for doing all that to me was that he didn't want us to be on the same level because it would be too risky for his career. I would be too risky for his career. I never felt more remorse in my life than I did in that moment because this was someone I'd given so much time to without considering consequences and he was willing to put me down just to maintain a misplaced sense of seniority. I felt betrayed and it felt like I needed to make things right, which was the perfect revenge. So I started at the core. I got his wife's Instagram business page and texted her anonymously that her husband was cheating. I added specific details about his body that would make my texts valid. She was already suspicious enough of him on a daily, and I was sure my texts would do enough damage. Then I pulled up my conversations with his unlisted number, where details of our meetups and dirty conversations during meetings were. I compiled them selectively, and by that, I mean choosing only the text that made him the aggressor, while I responded with vague things like, please stop crowding my notifications. I sold HR the story that I couldn't actually be aggressive with my responses, 
because I was scared that what happened with my promotion would have happened directly to my employment and because they'd already proved that the email he presented was fabricated it was easy to convince them that he'd been sexually harassing me and wanted me to lose the promotion to avoid facing the possibility of me coming to hr although i knew it wasn't going to be enough information to get him fired our sexual harassment policy was heavy on power imbalance and he was suspended for months fortunately for me I got my promotion application reviewed and I'm currently waiting to hear back from the interview board while he's facing possible termination. I wouldn't even mind losing the promotion at this point if it means he'll get to face all that shame of being fired. Honestly, I don't blame OP at all for going along with all this stuff all that time. I mean, I don't know about all the cheating stuff, but as far as the power imbalance goes, I know if I was in a situation where I really liked the person and that person happened to be my boss, I'd probably still rather just want to try to make it work, rather than ever accept that it just can't work. Even though it admittedly would have an extremely high chance of being very volatile. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another revenge story that was crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, click on the right. But with that said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.